Well, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attentions, please? Our session is about to begin. Please have a nice seat. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We are delighted to welcome you to the Entrepreneurial Startup International webinar as a part of this Natalis UNESA 2022 with the theme of building a sustainable and innovative startup in digital creative industries. I am Yusuf, and it is an honor for me to be your host in this very moment. And I would like to greet our distinguished speakers and moderator. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Without further ado, let's adjourn to our agenda. For a brief moment, we would like to invite all of you to sing our national anthem, Indonesia Raya, followed by Mars Unesa. Ladies and gentlemen, you may rise.
you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, you may be seated. Distinguished guests, faculty members, participants, ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to listen to the first greetings and warm welcome speech delivered by the Dean of Faculty of Business and Economics, UNESA. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Anang Kistianto. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, selamat pagi, salam sejahtera to all out here. Honorable Rector of Universitas Negeri Surabaya, Profesor Dr. Nurhasan Emkas, and all Vice Rector. Honorable all Dean and Vice Dean UNESA, and all Faculty of Economic and Business Head of Study Program, Lecture, and Student who are present at this academic forum. We are also pleased to welcome our speaker, Dr. Lois Fitzgerald from the University of New South Wales, Australia. Professor Junaidi Yaakob from the University of Sain, Malaysia. Dr. Jilmiya Campbell from Jim Duke University, Singapore. Nur Kairusi Sakirin from Nakhil in Indonesia and Muhammad Nurul Asad from Indonesia as moderator. We are excited to welcome you to our international webinar Building Sustainable and Innovative Startup in the Digital Creative Industry to celebrate Universitas Negeri Surabaya 58 Natalis. Indonesia has experienced rapid growth in the number of startups rising to five in the world. Startups are expected to contribute 100 billion dollars to the Indonesian economy by 2025 and employer 20 million people. Gojek, Tokopedia, Bukalapak, Oppo, and Traveloka are five prominent unicorns born in Indonesia. Given a critical role in the national and global economies and climate change issues that impact on business sustainable and economic activity, startups need to contribute to their stakeholders by incorporating environmental, social, and economic impact into their company goal. As a result, more sustainable business are required to create sustainable innovation that committing to getting business costs and safeguarding future generation need by reducing energy consumption and waste. The growing number of mindful or green customers who are aware of a free product with low environmental impact should be a traffic force for Indonesian startups to incorporate sustainability as their competitive strategy. Finally, by inviting the press speaker in this file, the Faculty of Economic and Business Indonesia, which has ACAS International Accreditation, is committed to disseminating more entrepreneurship ideas of sustainable startup in the global landscape. We wish their webinar will serve as a medium for all presenters and participants to exchange and share and discuss ideas, research, best practice, and solutions related to this issue. Thank you very much 
Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, Mr. Anang, for the warm welcoming speech. And now, for the last greetings, we will be delivered by the Vice Rector for Academic Affairs of UNESA. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Dontong Barbang Julianto. <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Selamat pagi Salam sejahtera Om Swastiastu Namo Buddhaya Salam Kebajikan Good morning to all audience Participants And <coughs> uh, Speakers Welcome to Universitas Negeri Surabaya I send the warmest greeting For all speakers Dr. Louis Fitzgerald from the University City of New South Wales, Australia. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Morning. <coughs> Professor Sunaidi Yaakob from the University of Science, Malaysia. Selamat pagi, Cikgu. <laughs> Dr. Silmia Kamble from James Cook University, Singapore. Ini negara serumpun juga. Selamat pagi, good morning. Nur Khosai, Nur Khai Rusi Shakirin from Mexico. In this international webinar. <coughs> Universities are the primary institution for the dissemination of knowledge through teaching and the, for the generation of new knowledge through research. This aspect makes universities essential players in achieving the sustainable development goals. Higher education institutions fully match the targets and priorities set in the four SDGs quality education, with calls for inclusive, equitable, and quality education. Through innovation in teaching and research, and active, active participant of all academic stakeholders, teaching, research, staff, and students, the universities should encompass the vision of the SDGs and response to the problem set up, set up by 2030 agenda. As other global universities, UNESA to certain strategies in order to fulfill the SDGs, such as incorporating all aspects of the SDGs in the university curricula, thus providing students with the knowledge, skill, and scientific culture necessary to address the complex challenges of sustainable development throughout their careers. University governing bodies also adopting policies that target gender equality, appropriate environmental management on campus, moving towards a carbon neutral university, cooperating with the local communi communities to promote sustainable goals, building a culture for responsible consumption and production, and making room for minorities and handicapped citizens. Globalization requires global cooperation not only among universities, but also among national and transnational institutions, corporations and businesses, as well as local communi communities on wider scale. Universities in the in the in the developed 
world and Europe in particular can play an important role to provide training and professional skill in developing countries in order to meet challenges related to SDGs such as this webinar. Through this international webinar, it is hoped that UNESA can spark the creative ideas of students and graduates to be actively involved in encouraging SDGs in the form of economic empowerment by creating new jobs, becoming comp competent and human entrepreneurs and having a significant positive impact on Indonesia development. Could I have to open this webinar? Yeah? Yes, sir. Okay. In the name of Allah, I declare this webinar is open and can be continued. Thank you. Give applause for Mr. Bambang. All right, Mr. Bambang, thank you so much for the warm welcoming speech. And now, before we proceed to our agenda, we're about to have a special performance about traditional dance called Siliwang.
Thank you so much. And now we are about to come to our main agenda and I'm about to read the rules for the participants of this webinar. First thing to do, adjust your name with the format, full name, underscore institutions, slash school origin. Turn off your microphone, turn on your camera, and make sure your internet connection is stable and sit comfortably and avoid backlight. For information, at the end of the seminar, there will be a door prize, so be active during the discussion sessions. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to our main agenda, the webinar sessions. All presentations and discussions will be guided by our moderator, Mr. Asar. And Mr. Asar, time is yours. Thank you so much, MC. So I hope that my voice is clear. All right. Thank you so much, MC. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Good morning, our participants joining in the auditorium. Also, good morning to participants joining on this Zoom meeting. I would like to say thank you so much for the committee to allow me to be the moderator. So the Honorable the Vice Rector for Academic Affairs, Professor Bambang Yulianto, the Honorable the Dean of Faculty of Economic and Business, Bapak Dr. Anang Cristianto, and also to all lecturers on the Business Digital Department, and also to our wonderful invited speakers. So I'm Asa, representing the Office of International Affairs, who will be the moderator for this event. So welcome to the Entrepreneurial Startup International Webinar to commemorate this Natalis of UNESA 2022 with the theme of building a sustainable and innovative startup in digital creative industries. So we have four wonderful invited speakers joining us today. So as mentioned by the MC, so we will give each of our speakers 45 minutes to explain, and then we will give the Q&A sessions to all of the participants. If you want to ask the questions directly with English, that's totally fine. But if you want to ask the questions in Bahasa Indonesia, I'll help you to translate. So without further ado, I would like to invite our first speakers. That is Dr. Louis Fitzgerald. Good morning, Dr. Louis. Dr. Louise Fitzgerald is an expert in education and communications program development. She is also a lecturer and advisor in education and business university of New South Wales, Australia. She dedicated her passions to achieve the development of her education program and supporting actions through various conferences and projects in the International University Climate Alliance, connected with almost 60 universities in the world. Dr. Louise Fitzgerald also participated in projects for the development of sustainable education in various universities in Indonesia. Wonderful, wonderful video. Thank you. Dr. Louise, good morning. Good morning. Selamat good morning. pagi. Selamat pagi. How are you today? Very good, thank you. And you? Awesome. It's a very good day to us also. So Dr. Louis, you will have 45 minutes to present and then we will uh, have the Q&A session after that. Okay, are you ready? I have a question. Would you yes. like me to share my screen and show the slides? Uh, that's that's on yours. If you you want us to to share the screen or that's yeah. 
maybe okay. maybe maybe that's best. Okay. Oh, okay. That's good. Okay, so let me start. All right. One minute. Get set up. Yes, it is. I, I, I just want to change it, the view sure. to this one. Yeah. The, okay, great. Sure. So um, thank you so much for the opportunity and for the very warm welcome. Um, I, I'd just like to say to the audience that I really wish I was in the room with you, but uh, we'll, we'll make the best of what we, uh, what we have, the conditions we have. So I'm going to talk about business sustainability, and the first slide shows um, three elements. We're talking about environment, society, and economics, and sustainability is that space in the middle. And um, what that tells us sort of immediately is that business – has a big responsibility because in order for business to be um, sustainable, we need to look after the environment and, and society. So let's dig into this um, a little further. This picture that I wanted to share with you um, sort of explains my, um, my path in terms of being interested in, in sustainability and where it all started. This is where I grew up in um, an area of Lithgow in New South Wales. And you can see that it's extraordinarily beautiful. And I think I've always had a, a love of the outdoors um, and an appreciation of trees and the sky and the ocean. And in, in a sense, that's really where my, um, my passion for the climate and sustainability has started, and it, and uh, throughout my career, I've always been interested to to see how we can contribute to looking after these wonderful um, assets that we have. So let's consider just this concept of sustainability because we hear it everywhere, and I think that before we get to the topic of business sustainability, we need to think a little bit about. Um, all the different meanings and all the different ways in which we use the term sustainability. But I think this table or this um, diagram really shows us that the quest for sustainability, which essentially is about survival, um, really needs to be seen in, in terms of um, what are the minimum the minimum things that we can strive for and wh what's the maximum, what are the limits. And so – the limit really is looking after the environment. How far can the environment sustain our activities? And at the smallest level, it's like how, what do we need to do? How do we use our environment in order to meet our own needs? How do we avoid poverty and look after the people who most need um, support and the resources that, that uh, many of us take for granted? And so you can see that these two are, in a sense, their intention. But the I want to talk about the outer limit because this is really the one that we are challenged with today because at the moment we're not really living um, in an environmentally sustainable way. We have overconsumption and we, we need to talk about this before we get to businesses. So you may have heard that we are living in the Anthropocene. And this, what this means is that we have um, had such an impact on our earth that really we have shaped and changed the nature of the planet that we live on. So we, we, we need to think about what we have uh, come from. And the previous epoch was called Holocene, and it lasted for about 11,700 years. So for the previous period, we lived in a Holocene epoch, and what that meant, or, or really what characterised it, was a, quite a narrow range of temperatures that we found were habitable for humans. And we've flourished in that period, but now we've hit an Anthropocene. And so we have moved from, as you know, with climate change, we can see that the the extreme weather events are the result of moving out of a comfortable zone of um, habitable temperature. And you can see just by looking at these 
changes that have occurred since the industrial era, how we have um, increased our consumption of the Earth's resources. So you can see how the uh, population has really expanded in the last 200, 300 years. Um, GDP, real GDP, gross domestic product, the way we measure our um, e economies and society's well-being has increased. Water usage, you can see every every single indicator on the table shows what's what how we've expanded. The biosphere degradation, the surface temperature, the amount of carbon dioxide we've um, least, released into the atmosphere, how much energy we've used, how much crude steel we've pro um, produced, and cement. All of these things are on an upward curve. So um, we, we need to think about, firstly, we've got to take responsibility. And I think it's very important that we acknowledge from the outset um, that not everybody has equally shared this expansion and, um, you know, growing um, consumption. So it's it's good for us to be reminded that the top 10% of earners in throughout the globe, throughout Earth, uh, are responsible responsible for 25 to 43% of environmental impact. In contrast, the bottom 10% of income earners exert only around 3 to 5% of the environmental impact. And I just want to acknowledge my colleague at UNSW, the, the, some of these slides have taken from a presentation of uh, Professor Weedman. You can follow up later uh, a little bit more about where, where all the slides come from. So the point is that we've got uh, many people in the world, not everybody, but many people have been living um, at a very high level of consumption and affluence. And this is a real issue for our for the rest of our survival. Okay, so we have to deal with this. And I guess the thing that might be very helpful if you haven't come across this before, the uh, the notion of planetary boundaries, and what this means is that it came. These boundaries were developed by a group of scientists in two thousand and nine. And what they, what they look at is how far can we go with what we're doing uh, in our lives and still survive, in a sense. So in 2009, um, scientists looked at what, where we're at in terms of these different areas. So they, they chose these uh, different indicators of, of how we use the Earth. So with climate change, um, novel entities, uh, ozone depletion, aerosol loading, ocean acidification, acidification, biochemical use, freshwater use, land systems, and biosphere integrity. And what they what we they said was where wherever you can see these um, orange lines, basically we've gone beyond the boundaries of what is uh, sustainable for the earth. So in terms of um, Biosphere integrity, so um, genetic diversity and functional diversity, we've overstepped the limit. In terms of biochemical flows, so our use of phosphorus and nitrogen in agriculture, we've also overstepped the limit. And um, the third one is in uh, climate change. We, we've gone beyond the... the uh, amount of carbon emissions in, in the earth. So this was already happening in 2009. So let's have a look at what the, what has happened since then. This year there's been an, an update and they've added three more boundaries that have been overstepped. So they are um, biosphere integrity. So this is a when you say E slash MSY, it's about um, – extinctions versus millions of different species. So th this has gone way beyond the limit. We've got the same thing biochemical. We've got land system change and we've got novel entities being added. So novel entities refers to 
the things that we've made, human-made species that we've added to the earth. And plastic's one of the most obvious ones. So again, these all of these areas that are in orange show that we've overstepped the limits. Um, and I think we need to keep this in mind when we talk about sustainability, because we, you, you yourselves as students of, of business um, need to understand the wider picture of what, um, what is happening on the earth and where we're at before you go out in your careers and become business professionals. It's very important that you have an understanding of the, the, the state of the world in terms of sustainability. And so you may already have heard of the Paris um, Agreement where we uh, agreed as a, as a globe to keep emissions below uh, 1.5 degrees of warming. And you can see that really we've got very little chance of doing that. What it will need is to have zero emissions by 2050. And really, um, it looks as if we've, we're, we're going to overstep that mark. The, the red line shows where the uh, how we're projecting in terms of if we stay as business as usual. Um, but it also shows what do we need to do. So by 2050, for example, not only do we need to have net zero emissions, but we've also got to be dealing with the emissions that are already there. And so we, it, we're, not, we're not saying it's um, impossible, but the thing is there's urgency and we need to do a lot. And particularly because we're involved in business, uh, business has the levers to make a change. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with the um, SDGs. What I want to do is to give you a minute to just think to yourself about which of these SDGs um, are related to business activity. So you've, you, we've talked already about gender equality. Um, you know, you can see clearly industry, innovation, infrastructure. You can see decent work, economic growth is very business related. Um, you can see sustainable communities, cities, responsible consumption and production. Some of them are very obvious. But um, I, I would like to have an opportunity to discuss this with you, and maybe we can during the Q&A se session. But the point is that all of these SDGs have a business component. And so business is really critical to um, where we move to and how our, um, how, how our communities develop. So um, often we, tell our, we kid ourselves that we don't necessarily need to worry. Technology will save us. <laughs> but I think this, this graph shows that um, technology is not going to be enough to solve the problems of um, environmental pollution and overconsumption. What we really need is a multi-system approach. And I, and I hope that by now, because I've talked a little bit about society and environment and economy, that I've shown that it, it's not just going to be one simple solution, that we really need to think about many systems. And so a multi-system approach is the way to go. But let me just explain a little bit about this um, this uh, diagram, uh, just sort of keep up with my notes. So basically, um, it tells a very strong story about what is actually driving greenhouse emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. So it's called the Kaya Identity, and it's been developed math as a mathematical way of thinking about what are the factors that lead to carbon dioxide emissions. And what, they, what they've identified is that there are actually four factors, key ones. So one of them is population. We've got GDP per capita. And then we've got the intensity um, of uh, energy, energy intensity and also carbon intensity. But you can see just by looking at these, these top um, lines that really the, the key indicator is G, GDP per capita. So while ever our populations are growing, and our economic activity is growing, um, carbon 
emissions are also growing. They're very closely related. Uh, okay, so as I said, I'm talking about thinking, taking a multi-system approach to looking at how businesses can help achieve sustainability. And I really like this diagram because it, it, it's uh, been developed by the Institute for Economics and Peace here in Australia, but it's actually a global study. And what they say is that positive peace is a way of thinking about where we need to go, what we need to achieve, to strive for. And it's <laughs> the optimum env env environment for human potential to flourish. And when you look at them, there is definitely a role for business. You can see that sound business environment is absolutely core to achieving the things that are important for all of us. So other elements of positive peace talk about resilience, better environmental outcomes, higher measures of well-being, better performance on SDGs, and higher per capita income. So why, what, what this is really touching on is a number of really serious issues that we're dealing with. One of them is inequality. When we talk about higher per capita income, it really means spreading the resources more fairly. And inequality, as you know, is really one of the most serious problems that the world faces. And better performance on SDGs is part of dealing with that. So I, I'd, I really like this concept of um, positive peace, and I'd encourage you to, to learn a little bit more about it. Um, So let's get to business. Now. So what can business do to contribute to sustainability? So just recap what we've said so far is um, that it's a, mul a multi-system approach is needed. We need to find a way of looking after um, everybody's interests, not just those of, you know, the, the rich countries uh, or people who have the resources, but we, we need to be more equal. We need to... Um, look after our environment, okay? So the, th the, the key thing for businesses is that we have to reduce emissions. That's our most immediate uh, game, goal. So we need to get to zero as quickly as possible for our survival, basically. And there are a couple of key things that businesses can do. So one of them is to measure and report <laughs> emissions. So businesses need, need to be much better and use transparent and accurate um, sustainability and ESG disclosures. That's number one. The next thing is we need to improve our performance. So we need to do this by looking at the entire value chain and find out, find ways of being able to um, provide goods and services, all the things that we do, the performance of the organization, the products and the operations um, throughout the whole value chain need to be mindful of social and environmental sustainability. Let's look into these a little bit more. So I'm not sure if you have heard about these different ways of talking about greenhouse gas emissions, but it's good for you to know that we there are actually scope one, scope two, and scope three. Emissions. So when we think about what a business does and if they are going to reduce their emissions, they, they really need to be aware of where these emissions are coming from. And so what uh, when we talk about, uh, you know, transparent reporting of um, emission reduction strategies and goals and, how, and performance, then first, the first scope, scope one, is the direct emissions from a company's owned or controlled sources released during the industrial, it, the company's processes. So this might be really obvious. Um, for example, how much el electricity and um, where does the electricity come from? Um, the second one is indirect emissions from purchased or acquired energy. So there may be raw materials that um, you're using to produce something else in your business and you need to account for what sort of emissions were involved in producing those raw materials. Um, and the third one, and often the one that's most difficult to um, 
or the one that's often hidden or ignored, is scope three emissions. And what this refers to is all indirect emissions that occur in the company's value chain. So it includes upstream greenhouse gas um, gases from purchased or acquired goods. So the things that we're actually using to produce and deliver our, our um, product or service, but also downstream. So um, what happens to our goods and services uh, that we do sell? So, if, for example, if, if, if my company is producing something that is in itself polluting, you know, like a car, for example, that runs on um, fossil fuels, then that needs to be accounted for in the company's records of its emissions. So it gets, you know, these things and really you can see how important it is that you actually know this stuff and can inform um, businesses about what the, uh, what's important, how they need to do this and how to, how to um, move forward. A couple of the things, the, the traps that you will see from business enterprises is that there may be greenwashing, and I'm sure you've heard this term before, but um, businesses engage in greenwashing. And what that means is that they may use communication and marketing strategy aimed at presenting a sustainable or responsible image of a business or company. Okay, so that can happen in many different ways, not just environmental. I mean, here we've got the example of a business um, planting trees uh, as a way of dealing with their emissions, but actually it's more important to look at the core activities. Planting trees is great, but it's not the same as uh, uh, managing core activities and assessing where the emissions are and how you can reduce them. But there are lots and lots of examples of greenwashing. I mean, one, you know, they they can also be in terms of the the social impact. And so, for example, I, I I'm imagining like a, a tobacco company that might sponsor sport sporting activities or sponsor a fun run. And when you think about that, that's in a sense that's a form of greenwashing because if you're produce if you're you know producing cigarettes, that's not a, a socially responsible activity. And, of course, there are many others, and I don't want to sort of pinpoint just one company because if we look around, you'll see lots of examples of greenwashing. Now, there's another one that's happening uh, increasingly, and it's called green hushing. And what that means is that um, when companies may have actually set emission reduction targets, but they're not publicising their performance, they go quiet in terms of how they're achieving them or what their performance is. And the reason why is because they realise it's so difficult. Maybe they might set really ambitious targets, but when it comes down to it, they're not reducing their emissions enough or, or at all. And so there was a study done in, in um, this year from a company, South Pole, and what they found was that, you know, a quarter of the companies that they looked at, they had the targets, but they didn't publicise what the, what they were doing, or they um, agree, you know, they admitted that this is much harder than what we thought, and so we'll just not talk, not not report about it. Okay, so um, this whole area of you know dealing with emissions and getting them to zero is very complex, um, very challenging, and uh, I, I don't want to pretend that I come from a country <laughs> that's managing it any better than um, anywhere else. In fact, we've, we've been real culprits in terms of our record of um, contributing to emissions. Um, I, I want to acknowledge that up front. But let's, let's talk about another aspect of this uh, emissions issue, and that is dealing with the carbon that's already in the atmosphere. And so this table talks about um, the different strategies and sometimes how easy it is to sort of get distracted by what looks like a good thing but may not actually be. And um, you may have heard of carbon sequestration. We, the idea there is that what we do is we, we take the carbon from the atmosphere and we bury it in the ground. And I can tell you that 
governments, particularly our government, has spent millions and millions and millions of dollars trying to work out how, how this is, as if it's going to be a solution to allow us to continue mining fossil fuels. So it's one aspect of carbon uh, removal that really hasn't proved effective at all. But there are things that are happening where we can, um, if we can find ways of capturing the carbon and putting it in long-term storage, that qualifies as carbon removal. But another aspect of, of carbon drawdown is actually using the carbon in other products. So, for example, you I don't know if you've seen these sort of thing, but there might be carbon capture and use, recycling uh, in short-lived products such as synthetic fuel or food and beverages. So these are uh, – this is a really interesting area for business. It's actually an opportunity to get into this. And um, I just wanted to – before we talk about – sorry, I've, I've raced ahead and I've – um, I'm going too far. But before I, I move on to talking about waste, I just want to give you some examples of carbon removal. And maybe you've already heard about these, but one of them is seaweed farming. And um, there's there's a, a projects around the world where we talk about macroalgae protection and restoration. And these are actually growing forests of um plants in the deep ocean and this is actually a fabulous way of drawing down carbon and I know it's happening in Australia but I don't know much about Indonesia and if you can tell me that would be great. Um, other other thing, other areas where carbon can be draw, drawn down is in recycling metals. So that's another business opportunity where rather than um, produce emissions in creating new metals, there's so much metal use that's already been used and created. And finding ways of being able to recycle metal is is really a sustainable, a, a, could potentially be a sustainable business activity. Um, and then another one in Australia that's being used is improved cattle feed. Cattle feed. I don't know if you realise this, but cattles create a lot of uh, methane. And so if we if we change the type of feed they have, the methane is reduced because methane is a, a really powerful um, and dangerous greenhouse gas. So here you can see the biggest one of the biggest areas of waste that we have in the world, plastic, plastic pollution. And it's an enormous issue. So one of the things that we need to do in terms of sustainability is to reduce our cut our plastic um, consumption. So the other thing that I, I hope that um, to in encourage you to investigate is the circular economy, because this is again a fantastic business opportunity in terms of sustainability. And what it what it's about is finding ways of using resources um, efficiently and reusing them. So we 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 talk about different aspects of what this means. It can be recycling, reusing, or re Pur uh, purposing um, products and resources um, so that we're not wasting, we're not contributing to the to the waste issue. So um, I, I'm wondering if I now have time. What do you think, uh, uh, Asha? I've got a, yeah. a 14, 14 minute video that I wanted to share sure, sure. with our wonderful audience about um, uh, startups at UNSW. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's fine. You might share. You've got enough video. time? Okay. Yeah, yes. So okay. Yes, I, I think uh, I might ask um, Ibu Ika to, to show it. it might, I think it might be more effective we, if we do it that way rather than I try and show it um, from yeah. here. Yeah. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Hello. I'm Louise Fitzgerald. I work for the Climate Alliance at UNSW. And today I'm talking to Gregory Davis, who is a team member of the Founders Program at UNSW. So Gregory, would you like to tell us about, a little bit about your role? Mm -hmm. So I, my job title is Senior Manager Curiosity in the entrepreneurship team. So 
the name of our entrepreneurship team at UNSW is called the Founders Program. So my team, Curiosity, we deal with all the early stage um, students, but also staff and alumni. And our role is to feed their curiosity. So we do that through many different ways. We have a lot of design thinking workshops, rapid prototyping workshops. We teach them the skills that they need to go further into entrepreneurship. We also have the, the incredible Michael Crouch Innovation Center Makerspace, which is open access to all people in the UNSW community so that students, staff and alumni again can come on in and get hands on making, exploring their ideas um, that they're trying to solve problems for the world and they can do that at the Michael Crouch Innovation Centre. I must say, Gregory, the work that you do is very well known across the university and I'm particularly interested in talking about startups. Mm. So would you like to tell, tell us what do you think makes a good startup or a successful startup? Mm. Look, it very much is kind of, I guess, some way that that secret recipe, isn't it? So every team is different. Um, there's a couple of key things that I always look for in a startup. And I think number one is diversity. Okay, so if we're a bunch of engineers and we think we're going to solve an engineering problem, that's great. We might come up with a fantastic engineering invention. Okay, but without that diversity, um, I can really see teams who are quite brilliant often just miss the mark a little bit. So I think that's always number one for me. They do need a good idea. They need to know that there is some innovation perhaps in that idea. They really need to know their user, okay? So again, you can have a great invention, you can hold a patent, but if you're not solving a problem for a user, then is somebody actually gonna come out and pay money for that? So to quote Peter Farrell, who's a great benefactor of our, of our ecosystem, you don't have entrepreneurship until someone's written you a check. So you have to put your product out there and make it desirable. So that is another one. Look, hard work is one which it is hard to be an overnight success. You know, it can take years literally to be that overnight success. So you have to keep going. You have to be resilient. You have to be prepared to do sometimes those awkward things that sometimes students don't want to do. You have to talk to strangers. You have to talk to your user groups, do your market research. And you can't just put a survey online and hope people will come along and do it. You have to talk to people on the bus, talk to people in the supermarket. So that drive to really make that difference is something that is very important important. Um, but you also need a community. You need access to other great minds, which is something we've really fostered very well here in the Founders Program. You know, we do have a community. We have an ecosystem of other entrepreneurs that love to help other, you know, more junior entrepreneurs come through. And in many ways, that is a very, it's very much what we call an unfair advantage. Um, people can come into our system. They can kind of stand on the shoulders of people that were there a few years ahead of them a little bit and help them along their way. Goodness me, that sounds um, like there's a lot of elements that really mm. contribute to success. I'm particularly interested in the diversity aspect. Mm. You're actually talking about people with different backgrounds. L yeah, look, diversity for me can be many, many different things. And I think in this context, it has to be different things. So it has to be that faculty, you know, that, that, that professional um, diversity. As I said, a group of engineers will probably be overtaken by some engineers and some marketing people, some business people. Um, but cultural diversity, of course, you know, gender diversity, diversity in all its lenses are so, so important. Um, there's, there's been some great research on startups and if they are this homogenous, you know, even if they are multidisciplinary, if they've all come from the same background, they're not holding each other accountable through these different lenses that a truly, you know, culturally or gender diverse team would. So it is so, so important. So given all those elements, I'm wondering if you could give us some examples of successful startups that you've been involved in. Yeah, look, we do have so many great startups that we work with at the UNSW Founders Program. Um, some of the ones which are really doing great things at the moment. So one of them is called HEO Robotics, High Earth Orbit Robotics. And this is a couple of PhD graduates from engineering. So we've literally got two engineers. Um, one, um, Hiranyas come from a Sri Lankan background. So there is that diversity. Um, they were playing with satellites and high earth robotics for quite a while and they actually pivoted a lot. They weren't quite sure what they were going to do. They were going from mining asteroids type of business model. Now what they're doing is getting satellites to take photographs of other satellites and selling that, sat that information to other satellite owners. So 
they're tapping into satellites when they're not actually doing much. They're over, this, over the ocean, they're not working hard. Getting them to pivot around, take photos and selling that information. Information is currency in these days. So they're a great startup, but they were in our system for about five years mm -hmm. before really being that overnight success. Um, so they're a great example of a startup. So where are they now, Gregory? They actually moved out. So some of the support programs that we have gives the startups we call incubation space where they can use our offices um, to help them launch. So that, they've moved out. They're just somewhere near Circular Key in their offices. I think they have a team of about 30 now at the moment. So, Goodness me. Yeah, and we're seeing that trend that people that were in what we call the accelerator mode maybe three years ago are now coming to the fore. They're now getting to that 20, 30 employee status. So we have teams in AI, we have teams in, in digital education. Um, we really do have a broad spectrum of teams. A lot of our health tech teams are coming through strongly now too. So I need to ask you then, um, you have probably seen some startups that have failed. Mm. So is it possible to characterize what makes a less successful startup? Mm. It is um, to some degree. And I think it depends on the way that we use the word failure. Because I think, you know, even if so probably some of the, the, the names of startups that I was just talking about before have failed in previous attempts to launch a startup. And I think if you look at, you know, possibly the world's 10 richest people, you would find a back catalogue of failure through that whole way. So we, our actual name founders is kind of predicated on that. We are investing in the human, not necessarily the idea that they're working on. So we know if we upskill them, we give them the tools for success, they will find that success. But it may take two or three failed startups before they get there. So why might they have failed? Sometimes the world just wasn't ready for their idea. You know, sometimes they're ahead of the game too much and there just wasn't that uptake. We look at teams that um, may have been exploring, you know, rat testing technology five or six years ago. You know, we just needed a pandemic to kind of create that demand for them. But in the meantime, they had kind of, oh, the world doesn't want my solutions so I'll move on. So timing is one is one reason why. So the biggest reason startups fail, I think it's 42% of startups fail because users didn't want their product. They weren't mm -hmm. prepared to pay for that, which is why you see me harping on about this. Test with your users, ask your users, ask at an early stage, ask the person next to you on a bus. Hey, what do you think about my idea? Um, do all your marketing survey, but don't be the people that have great innovation and have a great patent for a product that nobody wants to buy. You have to solve a problem for your user. Mm -hmm. Never fall in love with your idea, fall in love with a problem you're trying to solve for your user. That's great advice. Mm. So Gregory, I'd like to switch our focus just a little mm. and ask you about sustainability mm. because I know it's important to the program that, mm. that you run and to yourself personally. Mm. Mm. So what does, it, what does sustainability mean to you? To me personally, sustainability, um, it's a big thing, isn't it? But I think to me, it means that I have agency to make change. I think I can make personal decisions in my everyday life to make change happen, okay? I could buy secondhand clothes. I could choose food that I know has a better sustainable footprint. I can choose my electricity provider. So a lot of people want to campaign for the governments to make big change, you know, change infrastructure, change ecosystems. And that's great. That's me too. But for me, it, it starts at home and it starts with those choices that I make every one of the dollars that I spend. Is that the best um, output for my, for my hard earned dollars? So on a personal level, that's very much what it means to me. And on, on my, you know, within my, my professional realm, um, it also manifests heavily in a lot of work that we do from the startups that we look to nurture all the way through to the startups that we look to invest in, to the programming that we run. We're always, you know, we have a sustainability pitch night. We have, um, you know, sustainability development goal challenge days and stuff like that. So everything we do has to be measured through the lens of sustainability. Okay. And let's just talk specifically about mm. environmental sustainability. Mm. 
Are there examples of startups that you've been nurturing mm. that have contributed to environmental sustainability? Definitely, definitely. So we have quite a few, and again, very broad, you know, differences in some of these. But we have, we have uh, one startup, Giveable. Um, Francis is actually a, a UNSW Business School alumni. So Francis with Giveable has an, an online kind of tracking of your your ESG footprint. So that's measuring sustainability in environmental, social and governance sustainability, looking at your audit trails through everything from, you know, your procurement going all the way back to its its source and stuff like that so that you can map your your real footprint. A lot of people do the carbon only footprint, which is very popular. We certainly have teams that are focused solely on that, but a team like Giveable is doing some great work in that more holistic, you know, even looking at governance sustainability, um, which is a wonderful thing to be able to measure for a company, um, which people only want to invest in sustainable companies. Now we've seen that dial shift in the last few years that investors, you know, venture capitalists, sustainability means it's going to be there in, in the long run, basically, is what, what it means. So financial sustainability is so tightly woven to, to um, you know, ESG sustainability. So that's, for instance, with Giveable. That's a great example. Can I just ask you a question? Mm. So um, what his users, are, is there a market? Mm. Like, mm. is he doing okay? <laughs> yes, yes. She, actually. She, Francis, sorry. Um, <laughs> Francis and a twin sister who's, who's Singapore-based. Um, there is a market and, and, and they are doing well. And they've been able to do this by strategically you know, aligning and, and building a, a customer base um, that aligns to their mission. So uh, they are doing very well. They're doing, they're hosting a lot of, um, you know, thought leadership around the country as well. So they're doing great. Fantastic. Yeah. So that was just one example. So to, to give you a very different example, I work a lot with uh, a founder, Martin Collins, from a company called Charapy. So this is hardware now. So Martin has the ability to put a small, enclosure on top of a bin, which gives you the ability to scan your bottle and put it in um, instantly. So it's like the container deposit scheme, but it's a micro level. And we could have some at the at UNSW, for example, we could put some in food courts or interestingly on like the 30th story of a building. Every one of those bins has that ability to actually let only the correct resource in and also do with that 10 cents whatever that person wanted to do with it perhaps so martin has been a great user of the micro crouch innovation center makerspace that's how i first started working with him on the tools helping him develop his hardware product so there's two very different teams that are solving sustainability in where, very where is it ways. now Gregory? um but Martin is doing great. He's got bins popping up all around Australia now. He's getting a lot of uh, big corporate um, kind of um, contracts that are coming through. Um, so he's, he's going very well. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has been a really interesting conversation. Thank you, Gregory. It's always a pleasure, Louise. Wonderful video. Um, I think we are now at the Q&A sessions. Louis, what do you think? So we will give the opportunity to our students to ask you some questions. Uh, silahkan, Bapak, Ibu, atau rekan-rekan mahasiswa untuk bertanya. Kita memberikan kesempatan rekan-rekan mahasiswa yang bergabung secara offline ataupun online untuk bertanya secara langsung. Nah, tidak harus menggunakan bahasa Inggris, nanti akan saya bantu untuk membahas Inggriskan. Apakah sudah ada yang bertanya dari ruang offline? Dari auditorium? All right, so I think we will have a question from the students from the auditorium, Louis, but we will wait for, oh, silahkan. Jangan uh, malu. <laughs> okay. Silahkan. Ya, baik, terima kasih. Perkenalkan, nama saya Ustiani Tarahayu dari Universitas 17 Agustus 1945 Banyuwangi. Izin bertanya kepada materi, bagaimana cara untuk menjadi pengusaha yang sukses tanpa takut merasa dirinya gagal di masa yang akan datang? 
Terima kasih. Alright, so thank you. Terima kasih pertanyaannya. Alright, Louis, so I will translate the questions to you. So mm-hmm. this question is coming from uh, one of our students from the Banyuwangi. She asks, uh, do you have any tips to ensure that as a businessman, we don't have uh, to, to, to be fear of being failed during, the, uh, during our business? How to manage that? I mean, uh, sometimes we, we, we think that we will fail and what do you think we could uh, manage that? Oh my goodness! Um, yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? And I, I, I suppose it, it's. I, I just want to echo some of the mm. comments that Gregory made. That yeah. um, don't fall in love with your product, but think about the problem that you're trying to solve. Mm. So you know, what is it that you think the uh, community needs? Mm. What's what's a product that is actually going to mm. um, meet a need? And uh, you know, improve their lives in some way, yeah. and maybe that's that's um, a good way to start. So maybe it's about doing your research. Okay. Does that? How does that sound to you? <laughs> All right. So I'll try to translate to to the uh, to to her. Uh, jadi tadi uh, Bu Louis menyatakan uh, beliau mengambil uh, quote yang tadi disampaikan oleh Gregory. Jadi jangan mencintai produknya. Tapi uh, cobalah untuk uh, mencari tahu apakah produk itu memang diperlukan oleh masyarakat uh, untuk menyelesaikan masalah-masalah yang ada seperti itu. Alright, so let me ask the. Uh, silakan, Mbak. Mbak Rahayu sudah cukup jelas jawaban dari Louis. Is that clear? Sudah. Terima uh, kasih. Thank you. Sama-sama. Alright. Okay, so we already have a. A student wants to ask the questions from the auditorium. Silakan untuk bertanya yang ada di auditorium. Miss David Haryo Bimo from State University of Surabaya. Okay, my yeah. question to the speaker is: You have mentioned about green hashing and that the world's top 10 of income earners are responsible for between 25 and 43 percent of environmental impact. What are the most important and most impactful things that we can do? that are not included in the world top 10 most income earners in order to successfully encourage the world top 10 of income earners to run a sustainable business. Thank you. Yeah. Is that clear enough, Louis? Yeah, um, I, I guess um, it's, it's not necessarily... It's interesting. I'm wondering if you're thinking that the top 10 income earners are business people. <laughs> maybe maybe you're you're correct but i i think um there's a lot there's a lot that needs to be done and and that's why i i think you know that if we think about businesses we really have to encourage business students mm-hmm. to understand the importance of being responsible mm-hmm. um i guess in terms of the you know the the problems with with people who are wealthy and not really doing enough then it, it's up to governments really governments mm-hmm. have to have um, proper taxation systems mm-hmm. so that the people who are ma- uh, for example in australia we have the, an issue at the moment where a lot of companies yeah. that are selling gas and coal mm-hmm. are making what we call windfall taxes mm-hmm. so just because the market has changed uh, globally we've got a war in ukraine and suddenly the demand for fossil fuels is, is, you know, has really gone up. Uh, there are companies in Australia that are, we call them windfall gains, windfall uh, profits. And these sort of things need, need to be shared equally. You know, we need a taxation system that redistributes income. So I think there's a lot that the government can do. But in terms of businesses, um, government regulation and you yourselves, Hopefully, you're going to be the next generation of business leaders, mm-hmm. and we need you to understand the sorts of things that we've been talking about today. Yeah. So, why is it important that we look after our society and our environment, and that we don't, you know, that business sustainability doesn't just mean endless growth. It has mm-hmm. to be sound business environments contributing to many other aspects of. Um, Welfare and well-being. Okay, 
Wonderful answer. Oke, okay. uh, tadi apakah sudah bisa dipahami kalau saya bantu untuk merangkum sedikit jawaban dari Louis tadi terkaitan person of incomer itu, beliau menyampaikan ada dua hal yang bisa bekerja. Yang pertama adalah pemerintah sendiri dalam hal ini kebijakan untuk memastikan teksnya atau pajaknya itu terdistribusi dengan baik. Yang kedua tentu kita selaku pelaku bisnis yang memiliki kesadaran sustainability ataupun uh, sikap-sikap yang tadi sudah dijelaskan oleh Louis. Oke, okay. I think that's clear enough, Louis. Thank you. We still have two question, actually. So, silakan penanya yang ada di ruang auditorium. Silakan. Oke, okay, good morning. Allow me to introduce myself. Hello, my name is Igusti Bagus Prabu Fedayana Priharta. You can call me. You can call me Fedi. I am from State University of Surabaya. Okay, Miss Louis. My question is: There is more than 118 countries in the world with its own type of government, and how this different type of government in this country can achieve unity in reducing pollution or make environmental friendly business? Because from my learning and from my observation, most of environmental regulation that came that come is the result of political agenda and not from the willingness to improve or fix environment. Thank you so much. All right, interesting questions for one of our students. What do you think, Louis? <laughs> it, it's, it's one of the big problems, isn't it? I mean, um, Of course, we can talk about what we think is needed, but but achieving it is a different thing. So, um, for example, in 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 Australia, we've we've just come from um, nine years of a conservative government that really didn't believe in climate change, many of us. And so, you know, their environmental record has been very poor. We've had a change of of government, and and everybody is much more optimistic about. Um, You know that change will occur, and that we will catch up eventually. That we'll look after people. I mean, they're, they've just introduced a well-being budget, but um, of course, it, it's not. It, it, you've got a society where there are many different stakeholders, and there's a lot to juggle. And um, media has a very big impact on the way people think about issues. So. I, I think um, it's it's a really multi-system issue. Um, I don't think there are any quick fixes, but um, you know what? One thing I would say, actually, I was at a conference recently, and I was talking to a woman who has just survived very serious flooding in her area, and we were talking about having hope for the future. And she said, "Hope is not enough. You need courage." And for me, that's a really powerful word. What it means Indeed. is that we actually have to realize that each of us has a role and we've got to be strong and we've got to be courageous yeah. and do what we can. All right. Thank you so much, Lee. Uh, I'll try to translate your response. Uh, jadi, rekan-rekan sekalian, uh, perubahan tersebut memerlukan pendekatan multisistem. Tidak ada jalan pintas untuk langsung menyelesaikan. Bagi contoh, Bahwa beliau bertemu dengan salah satu orang yang uh, kemudian uh, karena korban banjir ya menyampaikan kalau harapan itu tidak cukup tapi perlu keberanian untuk berubah seperti itu. Thank you, Louis. That's can... very nicely tra translated, Asha. I'm very Thank envious of, of your um, <laughs> linguistic competence. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we still have uh, one question left from our participants. Okay. Silakan. Uh, okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rafli Darmawan from Business Digital. I want to ask a question. Uh, the topic is about the startup. 
Based on the latest data, the number of startups in Indonesia is the fourth large in the world. Reaching 1,705 companies and the most in the Southeast Asia. However, technological developments that make it difficult for human research, who are still unable to adopt digitally to become a problem that is still happening today. Many natural research in Indonesia still cannot be utilized until now. Even though it can be the main thing for bushiness and bushiness utilization. Become the wheel of the economies in Indonesia, how and what are our roles as students to be able to solve this problem? That is my question. Thank you. Okay, is that clear enough for you, Louis? Or should yes. I? Yes. All right. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I understand. Um, I, I must say I'm very impressed with um, the statistics that you've given us, that there are so many smart and innovative people in Indonesia developing startups. That's that's really impressive. Um, and I guess that that's uh, some of the things that you talk about in terms of they, they might have, you know, an idea and, and be uh, able to begin the process, but that they still don't necessarily succeed and it's not it doesn't necessarily flourish to become a business. Um, and what's needed? Um, I, I hope that UNISA is doing their role in helping to encourage um, the startups. And it seems to me like this event is a, is a wonderful example, you know, encouraging digital um, startups, art streets. So I, I think that there's so much potential and maybe going back to what De Gregory was saying that what, what is needed is to create an environment where people can help each other, you know, and work together and um, get the support that they need in order to develop their ideas. So I, I'm wondering if, if that's something that your university is, um, maybe they need students' encouragement to, to do more in the startup space. But, um, yeah, maybe, maybe that's it. But I think also it's really about this community, you know, this ecosystem. We talk about ecosystems mm -hmm. where people are supporting each other and uh, recognizing good ideas and, you know, uh, being critical in the sense of what's, what, what's going to work and what isn't mm -hmm. and dealing with failures in, in, in ways that are appropriate. Oke, okay. thank you Louis. I'll try to translate. Uh, jadi tadi Bu Louis menjelaskan bahwasanya uh, UNESA bisa berperan aktif untuk uh, mengatasi masalah tadi. Dalam hal ini webinar yang kita selenggarakan yang juga contoh yang luar biasa yang bisa UNESA lakukan untuk mendukung uh, startup. Beliau tadi juga mengutip dari Gregory yang bahwasanya kita perlu menyediakan komunitas di mana komunitas bisnis itu saling membantu satu sama lain dan perlu untuk uh, dipahami bahwa uh, kita perlu kritis terhadap hal tersebut dan juga tidak perlu merasa takut untuk gagal dalam komunitas itu. Oke, okay. I think that's clear enough. So, Louis, uh, there is actually one question from students. Oke, okay. silakan. Uh, I guess this one is the last question. Oh, I'm so pleased to see that it's a, a young lady. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hello, uh, hello. My name is Nirmala for University of Surabaya. In the years ahead, companies will be increasingly ambitious in redefining what it means to be committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI. But like most issues that matter, DEI cannot be meaningfully addressed talk or one of action or investment. How to redirect the economic power of their purchases to create opportunities for device suppliers across their value chains? Okay, thank you. <laughs> oh, I think that's the difficult. Okay, <laughs> you make it a little. <laughs> can I can I just say that these questions are so good that oh, we really yeah. need we really need um, you know opportunities to have roundtable discussions about them and. Um, 
it's it's difficult for me to think of what what the solutions are and, and i think in a way it's 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 not just one person's ideas it really does need um many people's input as to how, how we encourage edi equity diversity and inclusion absolutely it's it's so important and um i think it's really important for women to be you know encouraged in their workplaces and um the way that women work and um their perspectives on things are so important so, such an important aspect of really working you know solving world issues is absolutely the case and inclusion too in terms of different countries and what their voices are um one of the things that i this is probably not an answer to your question but i would encourage um all of you to take an interest in uh, cop27 so this is the next meeting of the global parties around uh, managing climate change and um the big issue there is every year now this is number 27 all these world parties have come and talked about how how we deal with this issue um a lot of people feel very little progress has occurred and one of the big problems is that the global north um is very good at talking the global south has the main that these are countries that haven't contributed to climate um change but they are suffering they're really at the forefront of the effects of the climate crisis and they go to the cop meetings every year make fantastic speeches and contributions but come away without um without money the money that they need so this is a huge problem uh, we need definite include inclusion in terms of listening to all of these parties and not just listening but also you know putting money where it's needed um so i think that you're absolutely right it's a real priority for our future um and it's it's got to happen on every level um so let's work on that indeed all right thank you lui thank you so much uh, jadi lui tadi menyampaikan kita perlu memberikan ruang untuk perempuan berperan dan terkait dengan inklusi tadi lui menyampaikan kita juga harus peka terhadap isu ini dan tadi lui juga menyampaikan kalau akan ada cop 27 Ini adalah konferensi yang akan dihadiri oleh pimpinan dunia terkait dengan climate change dan kita harus aware juga dengan isu ini. Well, I think that's all Louis for our session. Thank you so much for your time. So, we really appreciate your uh, attendance today and your uh, wonderful discussion with us. Just to let you know that you might stay on this webinar until uh, the end because we'll give you a token of appreciation. However, if you have another agenda, that's also fine if you want to leave the webinar early. That's yeah, right. unfortunately I have other meetings. Oh, but sure. uh, but fine. can I just say that I've yeah. really enjoyed um yeah. talking to to everybody to your the, our students and I do hope that we continue collaborating. Yeah. I re- I sincerely hope we that we yes. can meet again. Sure. Thank you so much Lu. Have a good day. Okay. Thank you. Same to you. Thank you. Thank you. Baik, uh, Bapak Ibu partisipan, sebelum kita ke pemateri kedua akan ada tayangan video SDGs. Dari UNSW. Silakan. 2030 is less than 10 years away and there's still so much work to do. We hope to address the hunger issue as well as the food waste issue. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight at the pre-briefing for the very first UNSW SDG challenge. It's a very exciting time ahead of you tomorrow at the Michael Crouch Innovation Center. UNSW's epicenter of innovation and entrepreneurial solutions. It's a place where positive change is actually made possible. And on SDG Day, you'll work in multi-faculty groups. Each of you will bring your own knowledge to find a solution to the tasks you've been asked to put your minds to. And in the course of the challenge, you'll also learn some innovative techniques, new ways of thinking, novel approaches to creating incredible ideas. You'll even learn how to communicate these ideas with impact and taking away perhaps a prize for your work. So we're here at the Michael Crouch Innovation Center and today is the SDG challenge and we've got over 70 students here today forming 12 teams. We are tackling 
plastic waste with Taronga Zoo, we are tackling food waste with Randwick City Council, and we are talking about communicating global goals with the Sydney Opera House. So the Opera House has a really incredible and powerful platform, both locally and also globally, to place important social and environmental issues front and centre. How do we connect with and move our audiences by using creativity, art and culture that truly inspires them to take action? The challenge before you is develop a program of how to reduce food. Taronga Conservation Society is more than just a zoo. We're actually a global conservation society that's more and more known for our research and scientific work. And our vision is to really secure a shared future for wildlife and people. If we think of the zip tie, what happens when plastic is the best design solution? We're really keen to see if we can find win-win solutions that capture both product function and benefit for the environment. So the pitch genius zone, so your communication, your pitch, it's going to be made up of three different elements. Your story, the words that you use, but also your slides. It's so exciting to see all these students from diverse teams. We've got engineering here, we've got IT, the creative arts, law, business, all working together in these superstar teams to solve the most pressing sustainable issues of our time. Today we've been ideating ideas, we've been working as a team, met new people from all different faculties and we've also had opportunities to work with mentors of the industry. You watch all these crazy shows like Shark Tank and they tell you do this, do that, but being in the environment and having uh, to think about ideas that no one has ever thought before. The possibility of learning something new is what brought me here and how is through the day I can say that I did learn many things working as a group and how important someone else's opinion is. Second opinion is always important and I learned how to communicate with others and how to present on a stage. Right now we are at our challenge time session so we're just collaborating together, just working on our pitch. We had a pitching session to get some ideas on how we can present our idea. It's been a good day just meeting new people and like thinking of new ways to create new ideas and hopefully make some change in the world. We're so thrilled to have such a great student participation and I'm looking forward to hearing all of the great ideas that they've come up with to really shift the dial on uh, key SDG challenges. Our solution, an AI software system that informs and prevents catering clients from over-ordering and catering food. Our strategy, Echo Brick, will create building bricks from used zip ties to establish shelters in disaster areas. Our innovative packaging has a special compartment here where you can drop your used zip ties in here. But not only that, we have a special enzyme decomposing solution which will help break down these zip ties. When you realise that you didn't know each other at the beginning of the day, hopefully you have now made more friends. You've made colleagues in this battle against some of these problems which you have solved today. So a massive congratulations and a thank you. All right, thank you. So now we are moving forward to the second session. So therefore, I would like to invite our honorable speakers, Mr. Zulnaidi Yaakub as the Associate Professor at University of Science Malaysia Penang. All right, good morning. Building a generation through literacy had been successfully done by Professor Zulnaidi Yaakub due to his active role in improving the quality of education through scientific publications in accounting management. His interest in education guides him to become a lecturer in University Science Malaysia who has an interdisciplinary focus in the field of accounting management, quality of management, performance management, corporate risk management, innovations and sustainable development. Mr. Zunaidi, good morning. Selamat pagi. Assalamualaikum. Hi, good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for joining us. So you'll have 45 minutes to present and then we will have a Q&A sessions with our participants. Can I start now? Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. 
Hello, hi everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning to all the participants of uh, International Webinar at UNESA. Uh, thank you to the moderator, uh, Mr. Asha, uh, all the management team and also docent from Universitas, uh, Universitas Negeri Surabaya. Am I right? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so the topic of my presentation today is about on how to develop a sustainable and innovative startup in the digital creative industry. Okay, um, first of all, I would like to say thank you for the organizer for having me for uh, our session today. Um, okay, so basically this is the content of my presentation today. Uh, I would like to discuss first about the, the, the rule and the critical rule of an entrepreneur, uh, not only uh, for uh, entrepreneur himself or herself, but also the contributions of entrepreneurship activity towards uh, developing uh, social and economic development of a country. Okay. Uh, second one, I would like to talk about uh, digital creative industry, uh, the new business opportunity that uh, I think... Um, uh, people nowadays, uh, th there is huge business and entrepreneurial activity on the internet, or um, maybe we, we could we, maybe uh, we can say that on uh, you know uh, digital uh, environment or digital landscape. Okay, the third one we're going to discuss about the business challenges where uh, for our developing countries like Malaysia and also like Indonesia. Uh, we, we have our own challenges uh, normally uh, uh, that must be understand in order for us to be a successful entrepreneur or in order for us to make sure that we are able to develop a, a, a productive and also a successful business, which is really important uh, for each journey for all the entrepreneurs. When, when you start your business, uh, the intention is not just only to have a business as, uh, for your income, or to, 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 to have a small business, but uh, we hope all the entrepreneurs who are involved into business, uh, they will have an impact uh, to the nation development, to the economic, to the creativity, providing job for the people, and also uh, contributing uh, to, to, to the society in terms of adding value uh, uh, adding value to the people around that business uh, because of the interlinkages between business and also society. Uh, later, we discuss about sustainable business model because, uh, again, uh, uh, when we do business, uh, the objective is not only for a short term, it's not only just to get an uh, annual profit, but also, in, uh, but also how our business can have a long-term impact and outcome on, 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 on the society, on, on the economy, uh, and also, you know, again, just like I mentioned to you, uh, strengthen the, the economic foundation of, of a country. Um, next, we discuss about innovation in entrepreneurship. Okay. When we're talking about creative industry, when we're talking about digital business, the, the elements of innovation is very, very, uh, very strong there, where people need to be innovative enough in order to become a successful entrepreneur uh, in in digital uh, in digital world or uh, under the creative industry, and the last one we're talking about the way forward. What is expected uh, to be to be done at individual level, uh, at organizational level, or at state level, or perhaps at country level. So the the, the expectations of people, the expectations of entrepreneurs on what. Uh, what they need in order for them to perform well in in doing their their business uh, through digital platform. Okay, so there are a long list of uh, benefits. Okay, uh, for society, uh, for uh, if many people in the country involved in entrepreneurship activity, or we call as an entrepreneurial society. Uh, with a lot of uh, when a lot of people uh, they are able to you know set up their own business doing their own business 
without uh, relying so much on the job provided by the uh, by the government or public service uh, so it is going to be a it's going to be a good uh, environment uh, it's going to be a good situation for a country because uh, by uh, having more people participating in entrepreneurship at entrepreneurial activities actually it contributes to nation economic growth because why uh, entrepreneurship contribute to nation economic growth because through entrepreneurship people uh, design people creating people doing uh, you know uh, introducing new products introducing new services with uh, uh, creativity and also innovation because uh, they need to have a product they need to have a service that is really creative innovative and also you know uh, able to, to compete very well uh, in the market for them to survive uh, I, I think Indonesian people is, is really very good in terms of uh, in terms of creativity being creative when, when they're doing business uh, you, you can see a lot of people you know participating in in traditional uh, industries uh, very strong example is like uh, like batik where, where, where there is uh, where each uh, regions uh, looks like they have their own batik and this it helps to, for local and also traditional uh, traditional industries um, job creation um, there is a limitation in terms of what a government can provide to the people or big com big corporation can provide or a job in, uh, employment, a job opportunity to the people. Therefore, participating in entrepreneurship is, is, is not only about getting money for your own or you, you get income uh, uh, for, for yourself and your family, but also by becoming an entrepreneur, you're actually providing job to the people out there uh, and you 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 become someone who are you know uh, uh, direct or indirectly you are developing your nation by uh, because uh, when when you have a business when you recruit people to work with you you are not only about paying their their salary but also through your leadership you are showing them what what is what is what is all good values of being a, an entrepreneur and, and how this is going to have a uh, you know uh, let uh, developing more more entrepreneurs uh, so if you be if you become a successful entrepreneur you recruit other people working with you and you become a good example for them perhaps you're going to be an inspiration for them to also become an entrepreneur when when they are you know they are ready to have their own business okay. again entrepreneurship is about being creative and innovative because in order for you to perform well, in order for you to compete with your competitors, there is no way for you to, to, to be a successful entrepreneur, but you have to be consistently creative and innovative. So today we would like, to, uh, today I'm going to discuss some of example, how innovation play an important role for a business successful. And the next one is about solving community problem. Um, they are, a lot of problems okay there are a lot of human issues around us for example under sdg you, you can see that there is there is issues related to water there are issues related to education there are issues related to you know uh, 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 resources uh, sustainable development and so on uh, food security all these are issues uh, related to the human, and some of the issues are very local, relevant uh, to your to your to your situation. Uh, for for, uh, for example, people are looking for uh, uh, for example people 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 are looking for you know safety environment. People are looking for you know halal food. People are looking for uh, safe uh, safe safer environment where, where, where we do when we do travel. People are looking for cheaper product, uh, people are looking for low price services, all this uh, something that uh, requested or something that, you know, uh, there is a demand out there um, that, uh, because of, of the problem. I'll give you an example, uh, because of uh, low economic development, uh, people receive 
salary because of the because they have a low salary they have low income because they have a low income they are not able to pay for higher price be when they are not able to pay for higher price they are expect they, they expect to to have a product alternative product that can be you know can be bought at a lower a low price so this is the rule of entrepreneur especially local entrepreneur where you can use local resources in order for you to produce product perhaps they are cheaper than imported product uh, however there is not uh, however this and uh, uh, this is not always true in the case because sometimes you get an imported product cheaper than what you can produce locally so again it depends to the situation if the product is too expensive because it's imported from overseas then there is a rule for entrepreneur to to use local resources available local resources in order for them to produce a local product which can be available in market at a cheaper price when we're talking about uh, when we're talking about solving community problems uh, in terms of providing product or services at low at lower price a cheaper price is not only about the rule and responsibility of uh, entrepreneur it's also the rule and responsibility perhaps can be can be played by uh, scientists okay can be played by researcher for those who are uh, university when we do research when we do when we produce when we do commercialization on product commercialization so that there is a space for us to contribute in terms of you know producing new a product with uh, perhaps a lower cost and also better technology and also uh, you know uh, make it uh, our daily life more productive and effective uh, technology advancement is another impact of having entrepreneurial society where uh, uh, as an entrepreneur you are always looking for processes uh, for product or for uh, what processes that can help you reduce the cost at the same time uh, improve or increase the revenue of your business so in order to achieve this in order to achieve this one of the uh, one of the enabler for for a company to achieve better performance in in their business is by uh, capitalizing the technology or utilizing the technology as much as possible because uh, norm uh, in general technology that uh, companies subscribe technology because because the capability of technology to help company achieve better productivity and also reduce costs and also you know expand their market uh, produce new product improve the work processes and also make it the organization more efficient okay uh, add value to the local resources this is another contributions of entrepreneur where, 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 uh, where in our region for example in Malaysia and Indonesia we have a lot of local resources we are very rich in terms of local resources but how do we add value to these local resources to become a product that can be uh, that perhaps that can be you know let the reproduce or product that can be uh, enhanced and exported to the other nation, exported to the other region, exported to the other countries, where we where we 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 can we can, uh, we, can uh, we can we can uh, not only sell our raw material to them and let them process us and we import it back to our country and we pay at a higher price with the technology with the technology with with the uh, with the a capital with an entrepreneur with the young entrepreneurs like all of you in the hall uh, to, today you can work together how to add value to the local resources and uh, develop it as something that not only can be sold in indonesia or malaysia or asian but also a product that globally accepted okay uh because we we in this region for example we are we, we are we are we are we are, we are happy trying new things as uh, receiving new culture receiving accepting buying new product from from for example from asian from korean from europe from arab but looks like we need to do more in terms of our capability and our spirit and also our capacity to export what we have in this region to the other region uh, again um, indonesia is one uh, one one, uh, one of the biggest economy and a very rich country in terms of uh, having local resources so there is huge opportunity uh, for for people in 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 in, in indonesia 
uh, as well as other countries as well in this region because we have we have we have a lot of natural resources that you know we 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 we, we they are waiting uh, the, all these resources need need to be you know we add value to these resources come uh, produce a new uh, product which is a uh, creative uh, product or using all the technology that are available for us to make sure that the product is later on globally accepted. Okay, development of supply chain, again, related to the local resources that we have. We have uh, just give you an example of tourism industry. Sometimes we have a big, we have a very, you know, a very, very beautiful uh, 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 scenario. We have a very, uh, very, uh, uh, you know, still naturally protected uh, area where people interested to go there for tour for for tourism. But if there, there is no entrepreneur to develop the area, there is no entrepreneur to provide, uh, to provide the the transportation. If there is no entrepreneur to involve in uh, services industry, performing arts, and so on. So it's not going to help to develop uh, the, the 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 tourist uh, the tourist spot. So uh, when 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 uh, uh, the development of an entrepreneurial activities or a business sector is going to have an impact on the supply chain of of all the services and products that are. Uh, needed in that industry. Okay, so when we go when we when we talk about startup, uh, I think nowadays, uh, yeah, we, we we can still try to open a small business, a micro business, uh, like uh, you know, we open a, a, a small stores, um, perhaps in campus, on campus, uh, we sell our you know, uh, like you know. Uh, uh, baju, or we sell uh, food, uh, drinks to, to the students. But that there is uh, expectation for, for the people, for the students now to embark into startup where the business uh, uh, using high technology, high impact, and high value. Uh, so during your students' time, during on campus life, you, you, sh you should you should try to explore what kind of business normally can be can be uh, can be digitalized. Uh, using technology, which is going to have a high impact at low cost and bring high value uh, to the students, for example, and also people around uh, your campus. Uh, so uh, uh, this initiative require uh, require a lot of you know uh, brainstorming. Uh, you, you need to read a lot. You need to uh, you need to learn from the other people. Uh, you need to explore what kind of business, uh, what, what, what kind of startup now, not only in Indonesia, but also uh, other countries as well. Uh, be, uh, because sometimes a uh, startup that available in other countries, for example, in Singapore or in UK, perhaps still not available in, in Indonesia. So, so, so this is something that we can try to, you know, uh, to try to understand what the kind of startup in their own country in their country and how we, we how we later can also apply the same the same or more or the, the similar startup in our country with some adjustment with, with, with the culture and the society because a uh, business is still much very related and uh, business is still related is a very much you know very much related to the culture the living style of the people uh, in, in the area uh, so uh, th there's always opportunity, there's always space for you to explore new startup uh, in, in, in Indonesia or, or, be, or, you, or you can be more global by, uh, by uh, participating in a startup that where your target market or your target customer is not only uh, for people in Indonesia, but also people from neighboring countries and also uh, at, um, if you, if, if if good, you can if your product or your service can be mark, uh, can be exported or can be marketed uh, um, globally. And today, uh, if by by uh, through technology, you, you can simply you know you can simply uh, market your product where your your customer your subscriber can 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 uh, can come uh, from many countries, not only in your uh, in your region or in your state. Okay. So how do we become a successful entrepreneur? 
there must be certain characteristics of an entrepreneur. Uh, when when uh, all people, uh, uh, entrepreneurship is not just about making money. When we're talking about entrepreneurship, it's not just about making money. It's not just about creating, uh, generating profit. It's not just about being uh, rich or, you know, uh, have um, uh, 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 a rich lifestyle, okay? Um, so these are all the characteristics and that are, you know, uh, uh, help you to become a, a successful entrepreneur. First, you have to be result-oriented. You have to really understand what you're going to achieve, uh, what you need to achieve. You have to, be, you have, to have a clear timeline and uh, the objective that you need to achieve. It, it, it must be measurable. If you cannot measure what you're going to achieve, you don't know what you're going to achieve. And if you don't know how you're going to evaluate or assess the performance, so it's going to it's going to be difficult for you to to to, to develop, or it's going to be difficult for you to assess the progress of your business activities. The second one is you have to be opportunity seeking. Yeah, you, you have to be sensitive. Towards the environment, towards the environment where you have to understand what is going on, what is the new opportunity arise, what is new development, not only in your country but also at global level. Because this development um, sometimes open up, uh, opens up new opportunity for you uh, to to offer new uh, new uh, new product or new services for the people. Um, for example, uh, if, you, if you are living a, in a very, you know, a very uh, crowded uh, city where people require better transport, uh, where people are not happy with the transport system, where people are not happy with, with the public transport system there, then as an entrepreneur, then you, you, perhaps you, 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 you are able to think that the, the the, the, the new product or the new services that can be offered uh, to the public, just like uh, grab uh, services uh, or object in, in, in Indonesia. Okay. Uh, creative problem solver. You have to be creative uh, in order for you to become an entrepreneur because uh, when, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you are creative, you are offered new solution, perhaps your solution is one step ahead than the other people. When your solution is one step ahead than the other people, means that you you do you do not have uh, competitors at all. Uh, this is this is about uh, ocean strategy. This is about blue ocean strategy and uh, and red ocean strategy, where it is good to have a business where there is no competitors in that business because the less competitor you have means you have more opportunity to grab the market or to, or to, to have a, a better, uh, to have a bigger size of the market. A strong network. Uh, business is, you, you cannot have your, your, your business uh, if, if, if you do, do not like to, to, to you know, to, to develop your, your network. Even now, you perhaps um, you're doing business online, uh, you stay, you stay, uh, you stay uh, network in order to help you, uh, you know, uh, organize or in order for you to make sure that the business is successful. Um, uh, so you 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 have to work in team. Okay, you have to understand who are good in in terms of con uh, preparing digital content, who are good in terms of doing marketing, who are good in terms of financial, who are good in terms of organizational management, service management, operational management, and so on. So this is really, uh, to me, in order for you to build a successful uh, business, uh, a good team is, is, is a compulsory because there is a limitation of, of, from what we have. Uh, I have a I have a I have a background in accounting. Uh, I train people in entrepreneurship. Uh, I teach students on how to how to how to develop how to start their business on campus. Uh, uh, I have a little knowledge about uh, about you know about technology, for example. So so all this. So in order for in order in order for a trainer to to help or to train an entrepreneur, one trainer is not enough. One mentor is not enough because. Each people, they have their own limitation, they have their own strength. So the same when, when you develop your business, uh, make sure that you have a good team. You find few people who are sharing the same objective, the same mission with you, and you work on this until you become a successful or you are able to develop a productive and competitive uh, firm. 
Okay, because at the end of the day, the purpose of you you build a business, you build a startup. Again, even you you want to achieve something for yourself, uh, you have to make sure that your startup or your business is going to add value to the society. Uh, ask yourself what is new in your business, what what is new in your product, what is new in your services. Uh, how 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 your business, uh, how your business, your services, and your product is going to add value uh, to uh, to or uh, how your product or services later will give a positive impact to the society. So always ask your, your question, uh, always ask yourself this question to make sure that you are still motivated in your business journey because again, you will face a lot of problems, ups and downs. Sometimes you, you have easy problems, sometimes you face difficult problems, but if you hold very strong to the reason why you exist, if you hold very strong to the philosophy why your business is exists, I'm very sure all these problems will become part of the process in developing you to become a mature and a more uh, well-experienced uh, well uh, entrepreneur. Okay. Um, you have to be a good manager, of course, because as an entrepreneur, you need to you need to manage a lot of things. You need to manage people. You need to manage technology. You to you need to manage fund financial funding. You need to manage the business growth and so on. So learn on how to be a good manager because um, uh, uh, this is a common process. The more you do, the more you learn. The 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 more experience you get, you you will be a better manager inshallah so by, by become by becoming a better manager you are able to you know manage your resources very well you are able to minimize the input and maximize the, and the output you are able to project your business you are able to understand the, the 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 environment because we are working now in the environment that is so complicated very well we are working under the environment that uh High uncertainty. Okay, um, during pandemic, for example, we are not sure how long we're going to have pandemic. What's what's going on? What's what what is next after the pandemic? Uh, when we're going to have a, our normal life back? We are not sure about that. So we are not living in in, in the in, in the environment that keep changing. The changes is so fast. Where you need to have, where you need to be a manager. Who are you have a you have a fast thinking. Uh, you need to become a person who are very responsive uh, towards the environment. So make, so you are always you know relevant to what is needed and what is expected uh, from the market. Uh, you have to have long term vision uh, because when you when you set up a startup, uh, you have to hold the principle why why you set up that startup uh, because when you hold that principle again, you're going to have a long term vision. Uh, if not, then uh, if not, you if you do not have a strong reason why you exist or why your business exists, perhaps after you get certain profit, you feel you feel satisfied and you you, you stop close your business, you shut down your business or you move to to, to the another new business. Uh, okay, so these are all these all characteristics of uh, uh, entrepreneur, if, if uh, an effective and efficient entrepreneur. But again, we as a human. Perhaps we 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 uh, our strength is on decision making. Our strength is on financial knowledge. Our strength is on leadership. We are not. Uh, we are not. Uh, we have to be realistic. Even all this list of characteristics a very long list. Perhaps I can add more to this list, but I think there is more than enough to give you an overview. What what is the characteristic of a good entrepreneur? Um, doing business. Uh, is, is a learning process. Uh, just like a student at university, every day is a learning process. You learn not only about the subject matter, you learn not only in your classroom, you learn not only in your lecture hall, but you learn about outside classroom. You learn about how to communicate with people, you learn about how to, how to you know, uh, how to sometimes how to form a team. You learn how to, how to make sure, you, you learn how to engage with new people. You, you learn how to sell your ideas. You, you learn how to how to survive and do, during during perhaps uh, when, when you have a limited budget uh, and how, how, how you manage your, your resources uh, during the whole semester to make sure that it's not going to have an impact. It's not going to have negative impact on your on your study program. So these are 
or the learning process. Again, uh, entrepreneurship or being an entrepreneur is also a learning process where you need to always learn every day. You learn new things in your life every day. You learn, you, you see new 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 problem uh you you solve new you solve new new problem every day which let them make you become more uh makes you better in terms of decision making uh managing resources and also uh, build a better plan for your for your for your business so who is an entrepreneur entrepreneur is only is people who are seeking opportunity business opportunity but they also understand the risk. Uh, they also understand the world is uh, full of uncertainties and they need resources to achieve this. So to become a successful entrepreneur where you need to develop a startup in creative industry, first you need to able to, to, to understand, you need to able to find the opportunity. You need to be able to scan the business environment and then realize, oh, this is a business opportunity for me. Then when you do and when you, when you, when you, when you, the, when you when you identify the business opportunity, then later on, uh, then the next step is how you how you going to how you how you going to grab that opportunity. So you need to understand what is resources you have, who going to work with you, uh, who going to help you, uh, how how much money you have, or, or where where you can ask for 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 finance, for example, and uh, what are the risks of doing this business? You have to do some analysis. Uh, is it something? Is it that the risk is accepted? Is acceptable? Is it the risk is too high? Is it the risk is low? Is low or the risk is just moderate? So all this will make you uh, productive, and you know what you're doing in, in business. It's not just you create or you create your business because you're interested to to have a business. We are understanding uh, the resources. We are understanding the risk attached to that business. With the understanding how you're going, how you're going to, you know, uh, 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 the uh, what is the expectation, what is the uh, what is your target for the business, and also uh, the long term plan or long term perspective of the business. Uh, this example of uh, the, uh, when we're talking about digital creative industry, Uping Iping, I'm sure very very, uh, very popular uh, in uh, in Indonesia. Uh, Okay, so digital creative industry for example is animation, video games, movies, music, and so on, where people using their uh, creativity, uh, uh, producing something, a product uh, or services, uh, and through digital platform. So this is very, I, I'm sure, uh, for teenagers, for students at university. Uh, uh, you know, uh, generating some income through online platform, for example, social media, through TikTok, for example, uh, through uh, is 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 uh, is not something uh, new. Uh, in other words, I would like to say, uh, many people nowadays, especially young people, students at the university, they are able to generate their income through uh, digital platform, uh, media social, uh, for example. Uh, however, when you're talking about digital creative industry, it should go beyond that. It's not, it's not just only about generating income for, for your staff, but also how you're going to embark into digital creative industry where your effort or your contribution is not only is about you generate money for yourself, but also you are able to perhaps uh, of, uh, provide job opportunity for the other people, uh, contributing to the betterment of the society in terms of uh, economy uh, add value to the what we have now in, in the in the market and so on. Okay, so these are all example of uh, business in creative uh, industry, digital creative industry, and all the business are also uh, uh, okay. We can have this business in traditional model, and we we now can have the business in digital model. Uh, for example, advertising, architecture, craft design, computer science, uh, television, culinary, and music. So these are all examples of creative industry that are now available on, on digital 
market or digital platform. So if you have the skill of you are a student in this area, you have a huge opportunity to become an entrepreneur without setting up a, a shop and uh, the, 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 the tengah bandar or the tepi, uh, the tepi jalan. But now you can start your business even from your hostel. You can start your business from even your uh, your uh, uh, your course eh? from uh, from your from hostel from your house. Now you can start your doing business. If you are a student uh, learning uh, about graphic design, for example, now you can have your own business on advertisement, on uh, on advertisement uh, where, where you can draft, you, you can design the poster, you can do uh, you can do uh, advertisement through media social, uh, you you can analyze the the social the the the, the, the data, uh, you can you can do data analytics in order to understand the the demand, the market, the consumer behavior, and so on. Uh, for, for those who are love uh, writing, for example, if you like to write a book, before this, perhaps the process of getting a book get published is very long. When you need when you need to write a manuscript, you send to the to the publishing house. They will evaluate they will evaluate your your manuscript. They, they will see is, is, if there is uh, opportunity if, if there is market potential for the product, and they will they will send to the uh, to the printing company and another uh, graphic where we do their graphics and they print they print all they print the books and later on they send to the shop. Uh, after that, uh, people are able to buy physically by visiting a uh, bookstore. Uh, that's story before the digital era, story before the internet era, but when nowadays you can write your book uh, on your desktop, uh, you, you can chat, you can edit on your own, or you can use software to help you editing, to help you, to help you, you know, uh, doing proofreading. There are, there are many types of software. You can use to software to, you know, uh, 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 you can use software to design your book. You can use software to edit your ed edit your writing. You can use software to to check the format of your book. You can you can use uh, uh, apps to to get photo for your book. You can you can use apps to design book cover. So a lot of services now available on digital where you can also uh, you have to you can also link all these provided services. Some of them for free. Some of them you need to pay a different some at a lower price, some at premium price. So now it's just about get ideas, what you need to do, what you're going to do, uh, what, what is going to, to have an impact to you and what, 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 what kind of product or services that you can bring value to the society. Uh, the rest, just like about, yeah, you, you have to brave enough to explore new application, uh, new, uh, new technology, new platform, new network, and also get to know the other people, uh, not only people in your university, not only people in Indonesia, through media, social, through the so social media, you now, you know, you know, you now can communicate with the people uh, from East to West, from Europe, from America, from, from Asia. So use this opportunity to, to, to expand your network. Because why? Just like I mentioned to you before, network is part of the is, is essential for for business, uh, successful business. Okay, uh, this is the main thing also of about uh, creative industry in Indonesia. Okay, so what what can we learn from this map? Okay, creative industries is more developed in more developed region. For example, creative industry in Pulau Jawa is more developed than Kalimantan. Okay. Just a simple comparison, but to have a detailed comparison, we have to analyze and study. You, you can read the articles written by uh, uh, this researcher uh, from Indonesia. Uh, so what, is the, what, what, what I'm trying to say here is creative industry is more developed in more developed area. And at the same time, the technology, the internet, the, the, the digital, the digital uh, uh, facilities or digital infrastructure is also a more developed in more uh, is, is more established in more developed nation. For example, in Jawa, uh, in Pulau Jawa, uh, creative industry is more developed than other region. But at the same time, in Pulau Jawa also perhaps digital technology, internet technology, and so on is better than the other region of Indonesia. Means what? Okay, 
means okay there are still a lot uh, of work needs to be done in order to encourage more people in order to encourage uh, uh, the whole nation uh, to to embark into digital creative industry uh, because uh, in order to, to to develop a digital creative industry there are certain Nets to be there are certain things need to be done, which is I I will discuss later in uh, later part in my presentation. Okay, again. Okay, Doctor Dunaidi, sorry for interrupting, but your time is up. I guess would you wrap okay. your presentation? Okay, uh, thank you. I, I would like to wrap up my presentation with uh, with this. Uh, uh, way forward, what we need to do in order to uh, encourage more people to embark into uh, digital creative industry, uh, all people uh, from uh, government, uh, from university, uh, from existing businessmen, and also from the people, from the, from the students, we, we are all need to understand our role in terms of you know, encouraging more people participating in uh, digital creative industry. Uh, for example, uh, we need to encourage more people. We, have, we need to encourage faster adoptions on technology and innovation among people, and also a comprehensive and inclusive participation of public and business, not only people living in 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 in, in city, but also people in living in rural areas. Perhaps we need to help them to how how how, how to help them embrace the new technology. Uh, for example, uh, using uh, higher you uh, using. Uh, uh, handphone, for example. So by having access to, to to digital and internet, they are able to you know uh, uh, utilize uh, the opportunity that are available on digital market. Just like a simple example, when people living in rural area, they have access to the internet, they have access to the handphone, they can simply market their product. Uh, they are locally produced. But you know, by by ZC, by 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 simple WeChat or, or WhatsApp. Okay, um, digital business, uh, creative business require new talents and new skill because this is a new opportunity, new world to a new world to explore. And yeah, it doesn't matter what, what what the subject discipline you learn in your university. You have to embrace uh, the skill, the new skill, and the new talent needed in digital creative industry. Uh, thank you, uh, moderator. Uh, if uh, perhaps I, uh, I will uh, explain more during Q&A session. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Zulnadi, for such a comprehensive uh, presentation. And I do think that our participants have learned a lot from your presentations. So uh, now I'll give the opportunity to our participants to ask some questions. As we have a time limitations, we will only allow two questions. So one question from the Zoom and a question from the uh, uh, the offline at the auditorium. So I'll give the opportunity for the online uh, participants. I guess we already got a question from uh, Latifatun Nur Aziza on the chat box. So what do you think about business development in Indonesia, which is growing rapidly, especially digital startup at this time, but amid issues of recessions, inflation, and many mass layoffs because entrepreneurs have to survive. And there are even some startups that fail. And she also heard the term bubble brass. I have no idea what is that, but what can we learn to take advantage of these events? All right. That's the question, uh, Mrs. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, a very good question. Okay. Uh, the business environment is not static. Mm. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, factors, uh, some good we call enabler factors, some mm -hmm. not really good is destructive factors. Mm -hmm. So as an entrepreneur, that's why we need to do some risk analysis. Uh, we have to make sure that there is still what we can control. If, if there is too many or too much risk that are beyond control, then you have to perhaps revisit your business model. Because when we're talking about doing business, it's not just anything you can do. You have to make sure that your business model first must be within your cap capacity, must be within your capability and make sure that resources to help you generate and run that business is available. That there, is no, there is no point for you to have a giant idea, giant business idea, but at the end, you don't have resources to support the idea. So it's better to, 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 to find a link between input 
resources, the process, and the outcome of your business. Thank you. Dr. Sulnedi for the answer. So I'll try to translate to our participants. So dalam dunia bisnis itu tidak ada yang statis, sangat dinamis. Ada faktor pendukung, ada juga faktor penghambat. Nah, yang paling penting kita harus melakukan analisis resiko, khususnya pada model bisnis yang kita kembangkan. Dan model bisnis ini juga harus mempertimbangkan kemampuan dan potensi kita. Sehingga tidak perlu membuat bisnis yang raksasa begitu, sedangkan nanti kita akan kehabisan sumber daya untuk mendukung bisnis tadi. Alright, I think that's all. Thank you. So now I'll give the opportunity to the students at the auditorium. Silakan untuk penanya dari auditorium. Okay, uh, so let me tell you, uh, so let me myself, uh, my name is Fatima Azara and everybody calls me Aza and I'm from State University of Surabaya. So uh, you have told about the characteristics of an entrepreneur. So uh, the question is, do we need to have all of the characteristics characteristic or we just need to be an expert on one characteristic and if we need to have all of the characteristics could you give us some tips to build and improve the characteristics thank you okay uh, thank you uh, thank you Asa, for your question okay uh, the list of characteristics characteristic that I mentioned to you is is, is not uh, it has been tested okay uh, many articles many research uh, has been uh, uh, all these characteristics has been discussed by many researcher and also by successful entrepreneurs when we read the book when we read the article journals when we do research and these are all the characteristics mentioned in all in in, in this document okay uh, however, we have to be realistic. As a person, we have a limitation. Uh, so therefore, there is a study on uh, to be an entrepreneur, to be a successful entrepreneur, is it born or something that can be trained? Or they, uh, there are study on this proof that uh, uh, entrepreneur can be trained. In other words, if we do not have that such characteristic, but we know that that characteristic is important to be a successful entrepreneur, then we should equip ourselves. What we can do is we learn from the other people, we watch video, we read books, uh, we, 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 sometimes we attach ourselves at, at a big company, uh, a successful entrepreneur, they become mentor to ourselves where we learn from them how to, you know, how to, how to, how to, how to, how to build all these characteristics. So if you do if you do not have all these characteristics, no worries, you still can become a successful entrepreneur. But what you need to do is understand that business, doing business or entrepreneur is a lifelong learning process. Every day is a life, every day is a learning process. You learn how to become a better decision maker. You learn how to become a better person in, uh, in communicating. Uh, you learn how to become a better planner. So it's something that you learn from, you know, it, it, it's something that you learn from day to day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sulnedi. I'll try to summarize your answer in Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, jadi tadi Pak Sulnedi menjelaskan uh, kalau untuk karakteristik sebagai seorang entrepreneur yang sukses, itu berdasarkan kajian dari beberapa artikel, ya, beberapa penelitian ataupun buku, dan beliau menyampaikan uh, ada dua pandangan yang menyatakan kalau entrepreneur itu ada yang memang dari lahir kemampuannya, ada yang harus dilatih. Tapi lo lebih condong bahwa entrepreneur itu bisa dilatih, asalkan kita kemudian bisa belajar dari entrepreneur-entrepreneur yang uh, yang lain seperti itu. Oke, okay, I think that's all. Well, Doctor, actually we still have a one questions left. What do you think, Doctor Sulnaidi? Is that okay? Yeah, sure. All right. One last questions from our participants at the auditorium, please. Your translate your translation is, is very good. Thank you. It's 2021. So I will ask about in contrast to conventional market driven innovation, sustainable development innovation or SDI must incorporate the added constraint of social and environmental pressure 
pressures as well as consider future generation. So, uh, what is the effective strategy to involve a wider range of stakeholders? Because uh, sometimes many of the parties have contradictory demands or interests. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for the question. Okay. Um, each business, they have their own stakeholder. Okay, so we need to understand first, who are the stakeholders? Okay, they are a stakeholder who are very close to the business, for example, direct customer, but they are also stakeholder who are, who are perhaps indirectly related to the business, public people at large. Okay, so when you do business, make sure you have the right principle, right vision and right mission because if you follow the if you follow the, the right mission and the right mission i'm very sure you're not going to do something wrong to your stakeholder because you understand who is your stakeholder employee is your stakeholder customer is your stakeholder supplier is your stakeholder creditors is your stakeholder but don't forget people at large the environmental the environment also is your stakeholder so in whatever you do, for example, you would like to launch new product, don't, don't just become an innovative by, by introducing new services or product, but you have to make sure that the new things or the new product or the new services that you're going to offer is something that can add value to your stakeholder. By offering something that add value to your stakeholder, you actually offering some you you actually offering something good or something that beneficial to your stakeholder so make sure when you do product development when you do business analysis when, when you do uh, planning for your product and services make sure that you always consider your stakeholder into your planning thank you Thank you, Dr. Sunaidi. Jadi, Dr. Sunaidi tadi menjelaskan setiap bisnis punya stakeholder masing-masing, baik stakeholder langsung dalam hal ini customer atau stakeholder yang secara tidak langsung uh, masyarakat umum. Uh, beliau menyampaikan bahwa yang paling penting adalah kita memiliki prinsip, visi, dan misi, sehingga ketika kita melibatkan stakeholders akan tetap sejalan dengan prinsip, visi, dan misi yang sudah kita bangun. Nah, lingkungan juga merupakan bagian dari uh, stakeholders. Jadi pastikan ketika kita membuat perencanaan kita selalu memperhatikan stakeholders tersebut. Alright, Dr. Sunaidi, I think that's all for the second session. It's been very wonderful and fun. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. So uh, if you want to uh, join the webinar at, until the end, that's fine because we'll give you the token of appreciations. However, if you have another agenda, that's also fine if you want to to leave. Okay. Again, thank, thank you. Thank so you much. to everyone. See you again. See you again, Dr. Sunaidi. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Bapak Ibu sekalian, uh, participants, before we move forward to the third sessions, we will uh, we'll take a look at the uh, music performance. Okay. One more time, mind me what it's like, and let fall in love. One more time, I need you now by my side. It tears me up when you turn me down, begging me. Just take a run. I'm sorry, don't leave me I want you here with me I know that your love is gone I can't breathe, I'm so weak I know just isn't easy 
don't tell me that your love is gone That your love is gone Don't tell me that your love is gone Don't go tonight Stay here one more time Remind me what it's like Fall in love one more time. I need you now by my side. It tears me up when you turn me down. Baby, please just take a while. I'm sorry, don't leave me. I want you here with me I know that your love is gone I can't breathe, I'm so weak I know this isn't easy Don't tell me that your love is gone That your love is gone Wonderful performance. Thank you so much. So stepping on the next agenda, we'd like to invite our third invited speakers, who is uh, Mr. Nur Hayrusi, the co-founder of the startup Nectico. Dedicated to work on financial technology solutions for cooperatives and small medium enterprises in Indonesia, Nur Hayrusi Shakirin had contributed to face the operational challenge in cooperatives and small medium enterprises through digital platform Nectico.com. Through a startup company, Nur Hayrusi empowered and encouraged stakeholders and small medium enterprise organizations to succeed digital transformations, building a sustainable economy in the future. Thank you. So, Mr. Nur Hayrusi, Bapak sudah bergabung? Oke, okay, thank you. Yeah. Silakan, Bapak. So, you have uh, 30 minutes to present. So, I'll remind you if uh, the five minutes left. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, maybe uh, I have a presentation. So, uh, yeah. Can I ask uh, for the committee to show my presentation? Okay. Thank you very much. 
Um, hi, uh, good morning all. Uh, thanks for having me. I feel very honored to have an invitation as a speaker. I would like to first congratulations and so um, happy 58 this Natalis for UNESA. Uh, all the best wishes and may all success for the future of uh, UNESA. Um, let me introduce myself again. Uh, my name is Lucy. I'm CEO and co-founder of Nectico. Uh, I have been an entrepreneur for 14 years and uh, let me share my experience and more of the story of uh, my journey in Nectico. So first of all, uh, Nectico is actually stand for Connecting Cooperative. Um, I think um, I want to share more about the name. Um, so I think it's really important for us to have a name that reminds about a mission or about the meaning of why we are doing the startup because that is also a reminder and also a motivation uh, for us to um, really having a mission driven uh, startup so that's uh, where we want to come up with the name of Nekiko uh, so our mission is to connecting the cooperative with the digital world. Okay, uh, more about it. So what is Nectico? It's an online-based application for all kinds of cooperatives or cooperacy in Indonesia. We are focused to make uh, cooperative uh, daily operations more easy, more faster, more digitalized. So it will be increased the connectivity between members, management, and all stakeholders, including the government. Um, and we want to improve cooperation to be more professional, transparent, accountable, and uh, become more advanced. And um, we found uh, that also Nekiko uh, helps the management uh, can be easily managing their members' data and all the transaction of their financial transaction it's become real time so if you can imagine it's like a mobile banking for cooperatives so that how we help the cooperative to automate the financial report okay next Yeah, uh, a bit about our history. So it's been established in January 2019. So there are five co-founders actually. And then uh, in May uh, 2019, we uh, start uh, to operate. And later on in June, uh, we start having a good relationship with uh, Bandung government. So specifically in a uh, department of cooperative and also small medium enterprise. And we have a chance uh, to be launched in uh, the, um, the birthday of the cooperative. And in 2019, October, we are part of an antler uh, incubator in Singapore. And then later on, at the end of uh, 2019, we uh, are part of the partnership with uh, Kemenkop, so uh, Ministry of Cooperative and Small Medium Enterprise. And later on, we are uh, also uh, having a partnership with um, Cominfo, so Ministry of uh, Informa uh, Information and Communication in Indonesia. Next. So um, a bit more about the vision and also mission. So our vision is uh, always about having a digital ecosystem for the cooperative. So we want to empower the management and member of cooperative to use a digital solution and embracing the accountability and also connecting the cooperative with a strategic uh, stakeholder. And we have uh, these three core values internally in Nectico, respect, achievement, and family. And why we adopt these values is to remind us that uh, in a startup, no one is uh, more expert than another. So we really want to hear any idea, any opinion. There, there is some argument, that's fine. 
uh, but we also like a data driven uh, and also trying to solve the problem. That's the, uh, the most important thing. On the other hand, of course, uh, since um, uh, the startup, uh, it's very dynamic, uh, dynamic situation uh, in the business. And we want to have everyone feels comfortable to work with everyone. Um, okay, next. Yeah, uh, so what actually the Nexico trying to solve? So the problem, if you can see a little, little uh, image on the right, uh, there is like a financial record manually. So using uh, paper and pencil, they put the number there. So if you can imagine right now you have a mobile bank, you can just open your mobile banking apps and then you see your uh, your deposit right your balance but imagine if you are part a member or a consumer in a cooperative you have to go to the office of cooperative you have to ask the management about your balance and they open the book and they calculate it for you so just to see the balance of your saving it takes so many process to do that it takes so many times to do that. So uh, that's what we see. It's really amazing that there are still many cooperatives doing this, um, even though some cooperative um, adopting um, Microsoft Excel or uh, Google Sheet, something like that, but still um, it's not efficient enough, right? So we want, to, we want to deliver a better solution, an efficient solution that we have the apps connecting one to another. So we have a uh, member apps, management apps, and also we have government to uh, monitoring the cooperative performance. Because what is really unique in Indonesia, um, we have a government focusing on the cooperative and yet the government still have some challenge that they cannot monitor the cooperative really well uh, because they don't have the tools and they uh, need some solution in that. So that's why we want to back again to our vision is to bring the digital ecosystem to the cooperative. Next. Yeah, um, and in terms of, okay, Netico providing an application but beyond that is actually a trusted platform for cooperative ecosystem why because we believe that cooperatives must be open must be transparent to the members because the, what what make cooperative is different is because it's really focused on the member so the member is all the members is the owner of cooperative so it's not just a consumer, but also uh, like the owner. And as an owner, you want to make sure that you have any data you need to know if your um, if your cooperative is healthy enough. If your if if your cooperative um, always um, promoting um, your interests as a member. So the cooperative is. Um, belong to the member that's uh, uh, what makes it so different so we want to make this not only just an application just a tool but it's a trusted platform so the member can you know check again right if if they put money in the uh, cooperative of course they want to know if uh, that uh, that that money uh, is going to uh, add to their saving so we want to to make Nexico as a trusted platform. Next. Yeah, so um, currently we have uh, about a hundred more co cooperatives who paid our solution. And there is a, a free version of it. Um, and there are uh, 700 more cooperatives using the apps um, and yeah, we, we, we learned that it's really unique uh, problem actually uh, in each cooperative 
they have their own challenge. It's not only about uh, a technical challenge. It's not only about they don't have a tool, but it's also about like managing the stakeholder within the cooperative itself internally. So um, yeah, and, and we are very lucky to be trusted by all of uh, these cooperatives. Next. Yeah, oh, one of the key things how we work in Nectico is building a good work culture, the fit one, okay? And, and we know that uh, we are still learning about the market. It's really new to us. We provide a new solution to an old problem. So uh, it's really important to set a right work culture in the team. And the key here is everybody learning something. Everybody has a thought about how to see the problem, how to provide a new solution. So um, we, we don't want people think a failure is something they need to be afraid of. So we want to, to break it down. We don't want also have a hierarchy. It's no matter uh, a CEO or managers, it doesn't matter. Everyone can speak. Everyone can have uh, something to, to speak up. Um, and we always encourage them. And, and sometimes um, people, uh, new people coming in the team and we, we think that it always, uh, we, we always give a chance uh, for, for anyone to, to speak, to have a thought because uh, so far we always have a fresh idea on it. So it's really important to have a good uh, work culture. Next. We can next on the next page. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, here uh, a little bit about uh, our achievement uh, collaborating with with the government and some cooperatives. Uh, we call it Belanja Barang. So the idea is uh, to make every cooperative um, they have stores. They have offline store. Some more don't have the offline store, but they want to sell something to the member. So the idea is, uh, what about if we, we are collaborating, we, we trying to uh, have a bulk buying, what we call it, uh, Belanja Barang here, and then we can have a cheaper goods and we distribute it to several cooperatives. So uh, this is um, how we actually trying to show that there, there are a uh, collaboration between the government, uh, the cooperative itself, and also uh, we as a startup. Next. Yeah, um, so I would like to share uh, more about the tips uh, here, several tips about building a sustainable startup. So tips number one, it's all about team. Yeah, it's about team, team, team. That's all we need to focus uh, at the beginning. And it's usually take about two, three years to just really focus on the team, uh, see if there is a weakness, how, how, how we're going to handle that. And um, really about like, not only hiring people, uh, it's about like building a, a relationship, build a team building. So it's not just one time action, um, and what is really important, it, it, uh, everyone has a commitment on it, has a common vision and do the collaboration. It's really important because, um, you know, if you are a big company, it's easier, it's easy for you to, um, you know, commit to the company, right? Because it's a big company, uh, you get a well salary and all the facilities, uh, but in the startup, you don't have all of that, right? Um, the the uh, the work is very dynamic. It's really exhausting. So um, how to build the commitment 
with the common vision to make everyone have a collaborative work to solve a problem. So uh, tips number one is always about having a great team at the beginning. And um, it, it takes a really long time uh, to, to build this. It's not uh, just one week, you know, it's, it's not only one year. It's, it takes years to become a really great team. Uh, next. Uh, tips number two is a problem, problem solving addiction. So you have to be really obsessed with the problem. It's, it's, not, it's not something like, oh, I, I want to be like a unicorn or something like that. I want to be a successful startup. No, no, no. It's it's about being uh, a dick to something, and um, it's about problem solving. It's about um, having a, a challenge come up, and then you have to solve it. Um, and I put obsession over the problem because you have to own the problem. You have to feel the problem. You have to talk with someone who has the problem, and and you know. Maybe, maybe you have some experience where you have a problem and you think over and over again every time um, and, and trying to solve it. So it's really about that. It's being obsession on that. And the second one is open-minded. Okay. Open-minded means um, that solutions, there are so many alternative of the solutions. It can be digital, it can be not digital. Um, and sometimes it's easy to say, oh, it's a startup. Uh, you use a technology, uh, this kind of technology. You put it there and it solves the problem. Sometimes it doesn't always work that way. So um, always uh, open-minded. And sometimes um, you, you have to like, okay, it's not, it's not using a digital solution yet. Uh, let's just do it manually. And successful startup always start with that. It's not like put this technology there. Um, it's important, but later on, uh, how to make the solution uh, become easier, more efficient, more effective, but in a later stage. Uh, at the beginning, it's really op important to be open-minded. So I, I want to put a highlight on that. Uh, uh, for example, in Nectico, uh, we, we build the, the application, but at the beginning, they don't use it. They don't put the transaction in the app. And we know that they, they have a habit of putting the financial, financial transaction report in uh, on the paper. And so we cannot force them to use the apps. So what we do is, okay, you don't have to put the financial transaction in the app. What if our team provide you with a service to put your financial transaction on that paper to the app so your member can have a, a real time, kind of real time, um, a transaction uh, information for that. And it works. They pay for it. They even pay for that. So uh, we have an opportunity on that. And I think that also part of being creative is always uh, being open-minded. And um, start with what works, of course, uh, that's, that's also part of it. Like, okay, uh, they, they put it uh, on the paper. So uh, maybe we, we, we can like build a surface upon it. So uh, it's always easy to start with what works uh, compared to, you know, inventing something new. Because uh, I, I personally, I don't believe that uh, there is something new. It's only a creative work that is not always uh, creating a new solution. It's some, sometimes it's just the solutions there. You just need to pick it up and trying to, to mix it so it works uh, for, the, for, uh, for the market. Yeah, that's it. Uh, the last tips I want to give to you is a healthy business model, okay? Um, 
sometimes uh, we 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 heard about like uh, a startup uh, burn uh, the money, uh, bakar bakar uang, something like that. It doesn't healthy. Um, we do not know how they gonna gonna be uh, become a profitable um, and. And right now, it doesn't work that way. Uh, obviously, we we must and we should have a healthy business model um, in mind. Maybe I start. It's fine. You you give it free just to know if if the solution works. If you can find some early adopters, some early consumers, so you can learn. You validate your problem. You validate your solution. And see where is uh, that solution uh, uh, become um, a revenue to your uh, to your startup or to to your business. Um, and and uh, what makes it different is because if you give someone for free, they use it. That's fine, right? But if you ask someone to use your solution, but they need to pay for it, and they do not want to use uh, uh, the, your solution because because it costs uh, the money, then maybe it's not worth yet uh, for your solution. Uh, but it's always important if you want to build a sustainable startup, um, having a, a healthy business model uh, is a must. And um, like I said before that sometimes um, you know, you want to use any advanced technology, and at the end of the day, it's a, a trading uh, business model that works for you. Um, it's an old model, business model. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. But it becomes healthy, and 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 one day, if if we are persistent enough uh, to find a better solution and trying to solve, get their trust. Um, over them with a solution, but they need to pay for it. Absolutely, they will uh, pay. Uh, they pay uh, for for the solution. Yeah. Okay. I think that's it for me. Uh, and the last one, um, I think it's really important. It's okay to fail. It's never okay to not admit we are failing. And no one and nothing can give back our time. Sometimes, and as an entrepreneur, you are over optimist. You know, you you are being um, so uh, positive. Um, and sometimes um, we know that it's a new solution. Um, it may not work. It's okay to fail, and you admit it as early as possible. Evaluate it and then trying to uh, fix it or bring a new solution and try it. And it's all about like trying for that. Uh, but remember, um, time is the constraint, is the limit for the startup, especially you don't have so many capital. So you have really limited time to do uh, and trying as many as, uh, as, as we can to, to become a sustainable uh, startup in a creative way. Yeah, I think that's it uh, for me. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Pak Nur Hayrusi. Thank you for sharing with us your uh, startup with our participants. And now, similarly to the uh, previous sessions, I would like to ask some participants to give you some questions. Are there any participants want to ask questions? All right, we have uh, students uh, from the auditorium to ask a question. Silakan. I'm from class 2020A. So I have a question. Many expert opinions or digital startup figures indicate that 2023 will be more challenging for digital startups. What are the prospects for swin stable startups or green startup in 2023? Okay, thank you. All right, what do you think, uh, Nur Hayrusi, about the opportunity of the uh, digital startup and uh, what is it, Ibrahim startup? Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, I think it's always challenging for a startup. It's always challenging, no matter the situation is. In a good situation, it's always challenging for that. Uh, um, I, I actually, this is my second startup. The first startup is a fintech startup. Uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, Sharia based startup. And yes, um, it's always helpful uh, that time. Like um, uh, fintech is like really on the hype um, and everyone talked about it wants to invest on that and so on and so on um, it's good uh, but it's never the ch change the fact that it's always challenging for a startup why because startup is a business where we handle uncertainty always uncertainty and if you think about like 2023 uh it's become a recession it's uh, economic challenging for all world. Um, wait a minute. Uh, for the the startup founders, I think it's really important to see on the other side. It's challenging for many people, of course, but also there is an opportunity, right? And people having more problem in a crisis. Um, and I think it's really important to see where is the opportunity here because like everyone say okay don't 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 set up a business it's not a good time blah 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 um, I don't think so uh, I think it, there are many opportunities um, at, at this time um, and and I think uh, for startup any kind of startup uh, it's really important to to uh, see the opportunity and become more creative on that like if you can imagine uh like a food delivery you know like like um oh it's a crisis and food delivery may be uh, impacted uh, really bad now uh like everyone changing you know everyone adapting to that uh, like like some restaurants okay they change okay how how to how to emphasize on uh, a food delivery service and some works or some changing, um, adapting on that situation. I think uh, that's the key. That's the key. Like, like uh, no matter, it's not about the time. It's about like how we see the opportunity, how we adapting our solution to that uh, opportunity. I think that's it. Okay, thank you, Pak Nur Khairul, for your answer. Uh, jadi Pak Nur Khairul tadi menyampaikan setiap startup pasti punya tantangan masing-masing, teman-teman. Beliau menjelaskan sebelumnya beliau ada startup fintech yang saat itu juga sangat digandrungi ya. Tapi yang paling penting juga kita harus tetap melihat opportunity atau peluang-peluang dan juga mempertimbangkan dampaknya seperti itu. Oke, okay. thank you Pak Nur Hairzi for the answer. So now we still have two questions I guess from the auditorium. Silahkan dari auditorium. Thank you for the opportunity that has been given to me. Let me introduce myself before. My name is Alan Ichan Ilyasa from 2022A. I want to ask to Mr. Nur, how to survive sustainable startup in today's first competition, especially for Nekito itself? Thank you. Yeah, Thank that's you. from the Yeah, okay. Thank you for the question. So, uh, it's about the competition, right? Uh, so, uh, how to survive? Uh, uh, first of all, um, right now, um, honestly, we have we have to be more conservative, right? Um, and if you heard that some startups doing like uh, um, like PHK, something like that, um, then then um, you know it's it's not a good sign. Uh, but Actually, in in point of view of the startup, it's a way to become more sustainable. It's become uh, more uh, healthy, having a healthy company for that, and we have to realize on that. If um, unless we have so many cash uh, on our banks uh, to run the companies, uh, it's another story for that. Uh, but um, I think. Uh, the key here is be, uh, become really careful adding more costs in the operational, especially if you haven't made money. 
So in case of Nexico, what happened? We 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 keep the number of people small. It's really important for doing that. The reason is because the more people in your startup, the more you have to communicate, the more facilities you have to give, the more things to be done, uh, and you have to adjust on that. And one time you realize, oh, you hire too much, uh, too many people. Um, so uh, back to the question again, um, how we are surviving. So we keep the people in Mexico uh, small, less than 20 people. Uh, serving 800 uh, uh, cooperatives. So that's really efficient, uh, of course. And uh, the second one is um, it's really to find another source of revenue. So we have a solution in the apps. Okay, then we want to move to another source of uh, revenue. And also, uh, we, uh, we, we are trying to, so, uh, to, to uh, explore a solution outside the cooperative market. So that's how we are trying to survive. And also um, having an advantage over our competitors. Okay, thank you, Mr. Harris. I think that's clear enough that uh, di Nectico, jumlah karyawannya sangat sedikit ya, ditekan dengan harapan tidak mengeluarkan kos tambahan ya, entah fasilitas atau ruangan dan uh, seterusnya. I think the students could understand your answer. So, okay. Uh, before we are moving forward to the next students to ask, I just want to remind you all: if you are the uh, participants from the Zoom, you could raise your hand or just, uh, write down your questions on the chat. Okay, so you could uh, raise your hand or write down your questions on the chat. Okay, so we already have another student who wants to ask. Pak Nur Harus, silakan. All right, thank you for the change. Let me introduce myself. My name is Muhammad Rafi Rizki. I'm from Surabaya State University. My question is, uh, when the cooperative member uh, still don't have enough knowledge about technology, or we can say it GAPTEC, uh, how Nectico can solve the GAPTEC problem first before apply the uh, platform as a solution for empower the uh, business of the cooperative. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the question. It's really a, a good question. Okay. So um, I want to see uh, about the uh, th there are two perspectives here, right? Uh, from the management and also for the member of the cooperative. First, for the management, um, as I mentioned before, actually, like we don't like force them to use the apps. So we have another service. Like, okay, just give me the information about the financial your financial transaction, then we will put it. But you have to pay for it, uh, and it works. They pay for for that solution. Okay, that uh, that solve uh, for the management. And for the member, it's uh, it's another challenge, right? Because if you think it's not um, uh, millennials, it's not uh, Gen Z, it's, it's still like a boomer uh, generation in that. And what you have in here, um, of course, then uh, for the millennials and Gen Z, it's fine, right? There's no problem. They are trying to use the apps and it works for them. But for the uh, baby boomers generation, um, it has a different behavior. So the behavior they have is they still want to uh, communicate with the management directly, right? So they um, go offline uh, or, or talking with the, their friends and, and then, you know, asking like um, how these things work, right? So it's really important to have like um, uh, their members to, to educate uh, among themselves. Uh, so that's the first solution. Uh, the second solution, we, we, we see a uh, behavior for the baby boomers. If they, they really want to use the apps, they asking for their children, you know, even for WhatsApp, for example, like, or Zoom meeting, 
you know, they always ask like, how, how to do this? I, I want to join a, a video call. I want to uh, do this, to do this. They're asking uh, their families, their, their, uh, their uh, children uh, to assist that. So, um, so what, what, uh, what we did actually for that is to make sure that uh, they know they have a benefit for the solution. So if any of their friends using Nectico apps to see a balance or to even like uh, submit a loan, uh, a loan, right? To get a loan, then they will ask uh, the, uh, their, their children how, uh, and teach them how to do that. Um, so uh, that's the thing. Uh, but of course, uh, the adoption is uh, a bit slow, but if you are consistent enough and also trying to uh, keep improving uh, the, the solution and promoting that you get more benefit by using the apps, uh, we, we don't worry about that. Um, it's just a matter of our time. Okay, thank you, Pak, for the answer. Uh, jadi, uh, terkait dengan customer it, Boomer, uh, orang tua orang tua kita mungkin ya, uh, tentu mereka akan lebih condong untuk pertemuan secara luring atau akan meminta bantuan anak-anaknya untuk mengakses aplikasi tadi. Oke, okay. thank you Pak. I think we still have the time for another question. Silahkan, <coughs> rekan-rekan, partisipan yang ada di auditorium atau di ruang zoom, apabila ada yang ingin bertanya. We do not have any questions from the auditorium, but how about on the um, uh, Zoom meeting? Are there any questions for our speakers? All right, if it's not, then uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing with us, your wonderful startup. And uh, probably you could uh, give us some closing statement before we move forward to the next session. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity once again. Um, I, I wish all uh, best success for you all. Um, and if we uh, think about a startup, it's, it's, not, it's not about uh, become a, a unicorn or something like that. We obsess with the problem. We want to try to solve a problem with a new solution. And uh, being creative is a must. Uh, having a great team is a must. Um, don't worry, don't worry about the situation. We always find an opportunity on that. Keep trying, uh, keep learning on that. Uh, I, be I believe that uh, no matter what, as a startup, you have to always face an uncertainty. Uh, that for sure, that's, the that's even the definition of startup is uh, handling uncertainty. So uh, uh, thanks again. Uh, hopefully there are many key uh, takeaways uh, coming from me and uh, maybe we have an opportunity later on to uh, discuss more uh, to maybe even like work together in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Panel Khairusi. Thank you. If you want to stay with us until the end of the webinar, that's fine. But if you want to leave from the webinar, that's also fine. Thank you so much once again for your time. Bye. -bye. All right, uh, participants, while we are waiting for the next speaker, we will watch some musical performance. Aku kesal dengan jarak yang sering memisahkan kita Hingga aku hanya bisa Berbincang denganmu di WhatsApp Aku kesal dengan waktu Yang sering tak berhenti bergerak Barang sejenak 
Agar ku bisa menikmati tawamu Ingin ku berdiri di sebelahmu Menggenggam erat cari-carimu Mendengarkan lagu Selaon Seven Seperti waktu itu Saat kau di sisiku Dan tunggulah aku di sana Memecahkan celengan rinduku Berbocengan denganmu Mengalilingi kota Menikmati surya perlahan menghilang Hingga kejamnya waktu Menarik paksa kau dari pelukku Namun kita kembali Berabung rasa rindu Sambil mengirim doa Sampai nanti sayangku Jangan matikan HPmu Kau tahu ku benci khawatir Di saat kau tak sadari Di sana ku sedang tanya-tanya Ingin ku bakar dia yang sering Mention-mention akun kamu di Twitter Namun kau selalu meyakinkan ku Tuk tumbuh dan percaya tanpa rasa curiga dan tunggulah aku di sana memecahkan celengan rinduku berbocengan denganmu mengelilingi kota menikmati surya perlahan menghilang hingga kejamnya waktu menarik paksa kau dari pelukku namun kita kembali Menabung rasa rindu Sambil mengirim doa Sampai nanti sayangku Celengan rinduku Berboncengan denganmu Mengelilingi kota Menikmati surya perlahan Menghilang hingga Kejamnya waktu Mendari paksa Kau dari pelukku Namun kita kembali Menabung rasa rindu Sambil mengirim doa Sampai nanti sayangku Di tahun 1974, pemodal asal Jakarta membuka usaha ojek motor di daerah Ancol. Yang mana pada saat itu langsung menarik minat dari para penumpang. Pada saat itu, ojek termasuk dalam transportasi yang tidak resmi. Karena keberadaannya yang belum diakui oleh pemerintah. Dan tidak ada izin untuk pengoperasiannya. Di tahun 2010, muncul aplikasi bernama Gojek. Dengan jasanya yang terkenal yaitu mampu mempertemukan penumpang dan driver secara online Dengan munculnya aplikasi ini Membuka berbagai peluang baru yang mungkin Sebelumnya kita anggap hal ini adalah sepele Dan hari ini kita tahu banyak terjadi perubahan dalam segala transformasi Terutama di bisnis Banyak bisnis yang dapat dibuktikan akan mengalami kolaps Hanya karena tidak dapat mengikuti perubahan And Darwin said It is not the most stronger of the species Not the most intelligent, but the most adaptable to change. Bahkan untuk contoh yang lebih simpel, dulu ketika kita ingin membeli kebutuhan, beli makan, baju, elektronik, dan kebutuhan lainnya, itu semua adalah aktivitas yang mengharuskan kita bertemu secara tetap muka. 
Tapi sekarang, just one click. Tantangan ini seakan-akan memaksa kita untuk selalu siap terhadap sesuatu yang baru dan menjadi responsif terhadap segala perubahan. Pertanyaannya, bagaimana cara kita menghadapinya? Perkenalkan Pak Ujatullah. Kita adalah kampus negeri dengan prodi bisnis digital yang pertama di Jawa Timur. Dalam menyikapi peningkatan kebutuhan industri dan lulusan perguruan tinggi yang berkualitas, diharapkan mampu beradaptasi dengan digitalisasi dan lingkungan bisnis yang dinamis. Fakultas Ekonomika dan Bisnis UNESA mendirikan prodi bisnis digital yang mempunyai visi untuk menjadi prodi yang berdaya saing di level nasional dalam pendidikan dan pengembangan ilmu bisnis digital yang berbasis etika dan bisnis. Untuk mencapai prodi S1 bisnis digital mempunyai misi untuk menyelenggarakan pendidikan dan pengembangan ilmu bisnis digital yang berbasis etika bisnis, menyelenggarakan penelitian dan bidang bisnis digital yang berbasis etika bisnis, menyelenggarakan pengabdian pada masyarakat yang berbasis etika bisnis. menyelenggarakan tata kelola prodi yang sesuai dengan prinsip good university governance, membangun kerjasama dengan stakeholder dalam negeri dan luar negeri. Karakteristik kurikulum pada prodi bisnis digital 60% dari manajemen bisnis dan 40% dari teknologi informasi. Profil lulusan prodi bisnis digital diharapkan mampu menjadi wirausaha digital, konsultan bisnis digital dan profesional pemasaran digital. Lulusan Prodi Bisnis Digital diharapkan memiliki managerial dan information technology skill yang diharapkan mampu menciptakan kesempatan, peluang, dan inovasi Hai. bisnis baru yang berkontribusi secara aktif dalam pembangunan bisnis digital di Indonesia. Mari bergabung dan menjadi bagian dari perubahan dalam Prodi S1 Bisnis Digital UNESA. Bisnis Digital UNESA Connecting Creativity Wonderful video. So I guess our speakers has already arrived. So I could uh, we could welcome our last but not least speaker, uh, Dr. Silmia Campbell from the James Cook University Singapore. Dr. Zilmia Kamli is an expert in tourism and hospitality. She utilized her abundance experience and industrial qualifications in implementing sustainable economic development at hospitals and tourism sectors. She graduated from tourism management for PhD program from Taylor's University, Malaysia, and Master of Science in International Hospitality Management from Leeds Packard University, UK. She takes a conference role as a leading commission for Euro tourism and hospitality sector. Wonderful. So good afternoon, Dr. Zilmia. Good afternoon. I hope you all can been. hear me. Uh, yes, sorry, yes, I couldn't clear. join earlier. No worries. No worries. Mm-hmm. All right, Dr. Zilmia, you have 30 minutes to present. And then after that, you have a Q&A session. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, would you like me to share the slide or um, are you going to play? I- I'll share the slide. I think you, it's you easier. All right. That's good. Okay. Yeah. Um, just give me a moment. I was thinking of the time difference between Singapore and uh, right. Indonesia, so I was timing it for 12.15. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So how is the group like? Um, are they students from the faculty? Yeah. Mostly uh, they are students from the Faculty of Economics and Business, but we also have some students from the Economic uh, Department from other universities. Okay, all right. Yes. And also there are lecturers there joining us. Okay, that's, yeah. that's great. And hello, everyone. Um, I see there's 128 of you also. <laughs> um, I, I hope we can connect at some other time. Uh, Dr. Ika has my... Um, email ID and I'm sure you can get in touch um, for any other further networking. Just give me a moment to share screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, let's just get it to presentation mode. It's visible, right? Yeah, it is. 
retreat. Um, so I'm Dr. Zulmia Kamli, as um, you know, your moderator mentioned, and I'll be talking about uh, sustainable tourism and entrepreneurship. I'm a senior lecturer and um, currently acting academic head for the School of Business. And uh, my tourism, um, hospitality and events is my uh, area of uh, discipline for research as well as uh, for teaching. And I'm also the course leader for the MITHM program here at uh, JCU. Um, so today I'll be talking about sustainable tourism. Yeah, I don't want to make it very heavy because um, there's a lot that you would have already covered and discussed uh, regarding sustainability from uh, the other speakers as well. Um, but I'm going to touch on it through three case studies that I would like to talk to you all about, you know, uh, to showcase how sustainability is so important for tourism as well as you know how it is very very um, relevant and um, as well as how it can be translated in um, into uh, you know tourism um, businesses especially those starting an uh, entrepreneurship okay so why do we have tourism and events you know um Really, because considering that uh, we have a lot of established industries and um, we have resources that we are using, um, why do you think we have tourism and events in our communities? Any idea? Anyone wants to join in or chat? Okay, never mind. I proceed with it. Yeah. Um, so basically, we are looking at, um, you know, different destinations, each destination hosting events, um, you know, uh, having a tourism department, having a tourism ministry or a DMO working in that destination. And this is all because we need certain, we need to have more diverse sectors for creation of jobs, for well-being, for um, you know, other purposes as well. So I'm just going to look at some of the common uh, reasons. So for economic benefits, of course, it brings in the money, but money is not everything. Uh, and that's why we have those pillars in sustainability. For education and development of staff, particip participants, in this case, the stakeholders, um, social integration and celebration. I think the lockdown taught us, you know, how um, important social integration is. You know, I mean, living in silo within our homes was uh, pretty pathetic, right? I mean, not being able to interact and not being able to travel. Somehow there is this sense of freedom, which is ex uh, expressed through interaction and celebration. And of course, for our cultural and artistic expression of our destination, um, you know, and um, as well as uh, artistic, um, you know, um, expression of our culture and heritage. Um, most importantly, to enhance the well-being of the communities and places that host the tourism and events. Yeah, that's the point we are doing it. Uh, I mean, we have tourism and we host events mostly because we want to help it improve the well-being of the community. And somehow this is lost. This whole purpose of uh, focusing on well-being is lost. And that's why I thought it would be good to take a well-being approach to sustainability in this talk. Um, well-being is something that is, um, you know, um, explained or defined in many ways, you know, through different disciplines, like from a sociological perspective, it is having a safe, supportive, free of crime, corruption, opportunity for personal development and expression. Whereas from a psychological perspective, it's about personal satisfaction um, and happiness. And um, from an economic perspective, which is, uh, you know, what most destination focuses on is having this uh, well-being through, you know, economic empowerment by having 
um, a lot of uh, choices. You know, I mean, you have more money, you have more um, option to make choices and um, your choices are based on that economic uh, freedom or money. Yeah. And that brings me to the whole point of sustainability as um, the concept. Okay, and if you look at it, sustainability, um, I know um, traditionally we've been talking about uh, people, profit and planet, but um, that is the triple, uh, you know, bottom line. But uh, now that has advanced. Uh, currently, we are talking about four pillars of sustainability or under the prism of sustainability. So we are looking at, of course, profit, planet, and people, but we are also looking at it from the governance point of view, yeah? Um, because you have to, even to have good economic conditions, um, social um, preservation, environmental capitals and environmental, uh, you know, uh, preservation, there needs to be a governance, there needs to be a um, management, and that becomes the um, you know, the fourth pillar of sustainability. And this was uh, the fourth pillar or the quadruple bottom line was first mentioned in 2000. Um, and now we are discussing this uh, with the four pillars. Yeah, And in tourism, this is translated very well. If you look at it, profit, of course, the profit from, you know, um, not only the money made from tourism through the tourism receipts, um, but also the infrastructure that tourism brings in, you know, um, which again helps the community where um, that infrastructure development happens. Um, in terms of planet and environment, tourism is one uh, sector that is, um, you know, an industry where you are so closely connected with um, the environment because you are uh, showcasing as tourism products the landscape of your country, um, you know, or geographical features of your country. So there's um, the nature, there's the, you know, of, um, of course, the built monuments and stuff, but um, the natural capital is something that is extensively used in tourism. So if it is, it could be the beaches, it could be the you know, um, mountains, it could be the tea estates, it could be the forest area. So um, tourism is very closely connected to all the pillars. And the most important pillar from my perspective uh, is the people or the social capital, that is the community, um, you know, um, the local people who are involved in tourism, um, the community, the um, stakeholders, and these are the ones who further, um, you know, take or benefit from the tour uh, tourism that happens in a particular destination. And of course, good governance, you know, I mean, if you don't have good governance, which is the fourth pillar, um, each one would be just fighting for their agenda, you know, um, businesses would be looking to make profit. Um, environment people sh would be just protesting, um, you know, on climate change and issues. And um, as usual, the co local community would be ignored. So the governance, the fourth pillar is very, very uh, vital um, as we move on. So I'm just going to talk about three uh, case studies to highlight, you know, why um, it's sustainability or sustainable tourism is important. Yeah. So the first one is Botswana. I don't know if you've been to Botswana. Um, Botswana is an um, African country and it's surrounded land doctor places. But of course, it's beautiful. It has a lot of, uh, you know, uh, inland waters. And uh, at the same time, um, there's a lot of natural resources. And um, you will see that tourism in um, Botswana, you know, um, they usually have uh, it's focused on the wildlife and uh, natural environment. So those resources are used for promoting tourism in Botswana. And they have the usual barriers, you know, because um, it is uh, the forest and the na nature reserves. They are located in rural and peripheral regions, um, you know, and um, fragile environment, especially um, with, um, you know, a lot of them promoting ecotourism. But 
perhaps not understanding ecotourism well. Um, but yes, Botswana does promote itself on ecotourism. Yeah. But let's look at some of the reality in Botswana. So in middle of the forest, you have these luxury resorts. Um, which are affordable only by uh, richer destination tourists. So you're looking at international tourists and not really feasible or affordable by the local community. Um, again, it's in the middle of peripheral areas and rural areas. So um, a lot of people are not trained to work in these um, locations, you know, I mean, in these uh, luxury resorts. So there's the tendency to um, getting expatriate workers so especially at the management and um, you know um, in the supervised real job roles and um, um, so let's see what the local community because they claim that it's ecotourism and it's supposed to if it's ecotourism it's supposed to provide jobs for the local community and um, if you look at the reality um, the options for the locals to benefit is through either the sale of crafts and boat tours, yeah, because they're not qualified or trained in tourism, or there is no capacity building programs around um, that can help, uh, you know, um, get the locals to participate. So um, they are usually occupying these uh, roles where they're either um, involved in selling crafts or involved in the boat tours. Um, some of them who can converse a bit and with little knowledge of uh, English are used, um, you know, as uh, safari guides. Okay, so um, the question is, is this type of tourism sustainable in Botswana? Mm, it would be sustainable if it creates more job and if there are capacity building in that particular destination to be able to get the locals to participate. Um, it would be sustainable if the employees who are employed there um, get to spend locally, so they are also contributing. However, you know, um, if uh, the number of workers um, from overseas are staying in the premises in that area and are not spending enough or taking back savings, so they, they don't really contribute so much. Um, generates profits only if more people are involved and, um, you know, and if there are taxations, um, you know, that the government benefits from, because some of the governments, they tend to, you know, um, keep uh, the tax free for investors to make it as an incentive to for people to, come in and, uh, you know, um, log in, um, you know, come in and uh, um, invest. So they try to make it uh, easier. Um, and if we can, it is sustainable in Botswana if the supplies and the services are obtained locally and brings in foreign currency, contributes to the, you know, GDP and the gross national product, all these factors, you know, depends on all the above factors. If there is local participation, local benefits, then of course that, um, you know, um, a case can be uh, considered, uh, um, you know, sustainable. But the whole question is, does it matter? Of course it matters because, you know, um, Botswana is also spending on tourism, marketing, and promotion. They're spending money on transport infrastructure, parks, and wildlife management, and um, you know any development incentives, managing of waste. So all these costs are to support the infrastructure for tourism. So if it doesn't give back that particular revenue, then uh, there's going to be, um, you know, no profits also from this uh, whole purpose, you know, and, um, and especially if it does not create sufficient jobs for the local. So, um, again, there are opportunity cost. The other case study is uh, from Newcastle um, Supercar Race, okay, and um, 
this particular car race, I thought uh, I would choose this because it's, um, you know, essentially done and in a, you know, a, a residential area. So um, in many cases, the residents have been complaining about uh, the car race, you know, they've been talking about how they almost feel that they live inside a racetrack, you know, and uh, they're not, um, you know, a, it's not a winning solution for the city because there's a lot of pollution from uh, people uh, who come, though it did generate uh, economic benefits. But um, however, you know, as you can see from the pictures there, um, where people protest that, you know, um, their sleep, their, um, you know, um, um, residential area, their neighborhoods have been um, impacted by um, the supercar race. Luckily, the car race is a one-off thing, you know, I mean, yearly thing, not one-off, but yearly thing. And, um, um, you know, that can really um, be solved through better governance. So this is where, again, governance uh, comes into uh, picture, better management of timing, better management of the location, getting people involved in the car race uh, also, um, you know, benefits uh, the local neighborhood, educating people about littering and stuff. So the environment is uh, protected. The third one uh, I wish to talk about is um, Venice. Um, Venice is one destination that uh, actually faces a lot of, uh, you know, over tourism where you see lots of tourists coming in. And, you know, the pictures speak a lot. Uh, if you look at the first picture there, um, that's how it is. It's a very delicate um, destination, you know, and uh, a unique destination because there are no roads. Um, they're connected with the uh, waterways and, you know, um, um, the mode of transport is uh, the gondolas or the boats, as uh, as you can see in the pictures. But then you have big cruise ships coming in, yeah. And these cruise ships bring thirty odd thousand people at one point to Venice, and that's why you end up having the whole city being, um, you know, um, being. Uh, um, overpopulated and it affects the residents you know I mean there are so many um, negative impacts and positive impacts as well but um, um, if you look at some of the positive impacts is that okay um, tourism has become a big sector in Venice and a lot of people have been empowered to get into tourism businesses and entrepreneurship um, but at the end of the day, there are also negative impacts. You know, a lot of Venetians are leaving Venice and moving to the suburb areas because, uh, um, you know, um, they can't um, handle the cost of rising, cost of living, real estate. And with, you know, the tourism money being lucrative, a lot of uh, the homeowners um, have started renting it out to, um, tourists, you know, renting out homes and really practically everything being turned into, uh, you know, a tourist attraction or a hotel or, um, you know, um, something for the tourism purpose. Like even there are cases where post office, which is, a, um, you know, a traditional post office um, in a unique heritage building being converted into a hotel. And the uh, the surroundings of that post office is a residential area where a lot of elderly live. So, um, you know, it, it, they had to go further down to get their pensions. And so you get to hear a lot of stories about Venice where um, even Airbnb has been playing a role in uh, the rise in uh, real estate, you know. So there are a couple of negative um, impacts from Venice and um, you know Venetians have been referring to the cruises and cruise ships as uh, almost uh, monsters you know because they come and bring in a lot of uh, um, tourists at one time and um, the tourists are using the public uh, transportation which is again delicate the boats and um, you know and they're not spending much there because they're 
when they come on the cruise ship, they've already paid the cruise business their package money and they're not using the local uh, hotels. Um, and, um, you know, they're using the public uh, waterways and it's uh, hard for the residents. And um, they have been even, uh, you know, um, very strong protest against tourism in Venice. And somehow this is um, a clear example of why sustainability needs to be thought through and why good governance, you know, should play a key role in um, these um, in countering these uh, impacts. So, so if it's not only money that tourism is being lucrative, what is it? You know, so it's very good to look at it through uh, the different capitals, um, like tourism um, shares with um, you know through tourism how human capital can be impacted, cultural capital can be um, impacted, you know. Um, of course, tourism contributes a lot positively to, um, you know, cultural capital in preservation of um, certain heritage, certain um, culture, you know, especially intangible culture, which is um, getting eroded. But um, if tourism can uh, contribute to all the capitals, then of course we can have um, a move to towards um, you know sustainability. Um, if you see this particular um, you know gross na uh, um, national happiness or GNH uh, figure here, um, you will see that um, this is the, a research done by certain Bhutanese uh, um, you know researchers and Bhutan they focus on gross national happiness, you know, rather than um, GDP. And for them, the happiness um, is conveyed through good governance, cultural diversity and resilience, education, um, health, psychological well-being, you know, living standards. So um, they look at tourism uh, through this. And currently, Bhutan has also increased, you know, they have... Um, uh, they don't have a one-off visa fees. Um, they're the only country that charges per day, literally. And um, that is to cover any negative impact. And also they have risen the visa fees so that, um, you know, um, tourists, um, they get to get a lot of tourists that come in, but, you know, only those interested in visiting Bhutan and not the mass tourism appeal but this is of course debatable you know um because um mass tourism uh, despite its flaws can reach to the uh, local community uh, more so if we want tourism and events to be sustainable it has to have a positive uh, contribution across all the forms of capital and to all the participants, if you look at the participants, you have the destination, um, community residents, tourism workers, tourism business owners, um, you know, and the wider community and planet, as well as uh, the tourists themselves. And um, if you're looking at the regions, there's the generating region where tourists come from. And um, of course, the individual uh, tourist who is coming in just to, um, you know, or to that particular destination, or there could be transit regions. And all these regions have to somehow benefit from um, the tourism um, in, set up in place. Yeah, so there's a need to eliminate and minimize the negative impact and uh, maximize the positive impacts across all the areas and to all the participants or um, stakeholders. So how can we do this? Um, through good government policy instruments, planning approach, ongoing destination management. So you see um, the need for having that fourth pillar uh, of sustainability that is good governance and um, through uh, and, and management, you know, and there's also a need to understand the nature of, of tourism and events um, impact on destination community well-being. You know, I mean, if we are not beneficial to 
um, the community, then um, there is no scope of uh, sustaining tourism for the longer run. The negative impacts would be too much to handle. And then you would suddenly have to close down the destination. And we saw that in um, a lot of examples, you know, um, across the world where they had to close certain destination. I think there was one, um, a particular beach, uh, which was, um, I think, in Thailand, which became popular, um, you know, for uh, the movie Beach by Leonardo DiCaprio and had uh, seen over tourism happening and a lot of littering and, you know, um, the beach environment being uh, impacted. So there's a need to understand that nature of, um, you know, tourism and uh, um, the event uh, impacts on that destination and uh, the community well-being. Yeah. Yet, what do destinations do? We only talk about number of tourists arriving, tourism receipt, that is the money that is coming in, and the contribution to GDP and the number of jobs created. We can understand the number of jobs created, but um, you know somehow the other pillars of sustainability are ignored. And the focus has always been growth oriented and towards um, you know, generating more money. And um, if you look at um, you know, um, the other pillars, like for example, due to sustainability awareness, um, climate change, because you can see visible impact on uh, the environment and uh, on the climate, um, you know, um, and no other country better than Indonesia can understand this, you know, with all the um, climate change effect that's uh, happening um, in the region. And um, because of that, environment pillar is also emphasized. But what is usually fuzzy and ignored is the social um, indicators and the social uh, impact on uh, tourism, you know, of, of, of tourism on that destination, you know. Um, so we need to also think about simultaneously social indicators to um, measure tourism success or assess tourism success, yeah. And some of these social indicators could be social cohesion, how tourism brings community together, um, and social interactions, social empowerment, you know, how it can actually make communities, uh, you know, live better and have a, um, have an improved lifestyle in especially rural areas. In fact, I'm doing a research project in um, um, Kiluan region, Lampung in Indonesia itself. And um, we are looking at artisanal fishers who have been socially empowered through tourism, you know, by taking up tourism entrepreneurship. Um, they have been um, renting out their homes as homestays. Um, and they have been uh, using their boats for dolphin fishing. And it has helped that community because from um, not being able to afford two meals a day, they can, you know, their progress to, um, you know, having being accepted in the society as well as uh, um, being able to afford education for their children and um, uh, we focused on artisanal fishers because um, you know they also have a large uh, number of ch uh, children into labor you know child labor um, due to the needs of poverty and um, other aspects so um we must try to look at how beneficial it is to the community. So social empowerment, community well-being, contribution to preserve cultural assets, you know, um, and then community participation. Are people able to participate like in Botswana? I mean, people, if there is no capacity program in that location, um, how do the locals be expected to, you know, participate um, in tourism. So local participation, it should be encouraged to be able to be sustainable in the long run. And of course, stakeholder satisfaction. Is it beneficial for everybody or is it just the business, you know, and um, not even the destination or the government? Yeah. And of course, education, how this is empowering people in terms of uh, training and capacity building 
Okay, and um, that can be seen through um, the positive impacts brought by um, social, cultural uh, perspective, yeah. And there's a need to reduce the negative uh, impacts, you know, so negative social cultural impacts like commodification, crime. Crime, I mean, if, if, if you have high crime level, then uh, despite how much you spend on marketing efforts and, you know, economically and bringing in the infrastructure, um, tourists would fear to travel, you know. And, um, of course, demonstration effect, um, displacement because of tourism, um, there's been a lot of displacement also, you know, with um, tourist resorts opening in uh, uh, coastal areas and blocking beaches. So um, there are a lot of examples where you can see that there is an exploitation of the local community or the resources or the natural resources, the environment. So those have to be, um, you know, converted through proper governance and through proper uh, management measures in order to be sustainable. So sustainable is like, uh, you know, um, being capable of being continued with long term effect on the, I mean, with minimal long term effect on the environment and balancing the needs of the present and the needs of the future. Okay. And economically, being, um, you know, bearable, economically viable, ethical, and socially equitable for local community. Um, there have been debates around this, whether this is feasible. And um, that's why, um, in fact, the discussion has moved from sustainable tourism to regenerative tourism, where um, there's giving back to the you know, um, community, because um, resources are resources. At the end of the day, we are going to be using it unless we find ways to preserve, unless we find ways to replicate our resources, they are going to be used. And to maintain that in the long run could be a challenge. So the way to move forward could be through regenerative tourism, you know, by giving back to the community, giving back to that particular destination. There have been a lot of creative entrepreneurship ideas, you know, um, where um, regenerative tourism is slowly picking up and finding its way, you know, um, in terms of uh, contributing and engaging in the, you know, um, destination more. So entrepreneurship in tourism, um, it's in a constant change of uh, state, you know, and there's a lot of innovation happening. And um, especially IT um, has been, um, you know, um, involved in terms of um, converting destination into smart city locations. And, uh, um, you know, it has been changing patterns of tourism consumption as well. So, um, we must look at how um, entrepreneurship ideas could actually benefit, uh, you know, um, tourism with sustainability in mind. So these are a couple of ideas, uh, you know, to where tourism related businesses, uh, where you obviously see a lot of entrepreneurship uh, startups, okay? And um, some of them are tourism related business and some are unconventional tourism related businesses, you know, whether it's a photographic safari, you know, walking trails, you could create a lot of walking trails, um, you know, bird watching tours, and there could be a com blended experience now with the um, technology coming into place. But there are a lot of ways that, you know, um, tourism can empower local communities and increase the uh, participation of the local communities. And these are some of the, you know, um, great ideas that uh, could be uh, focused on. Secondary activities related to tourism. Tourism has this uh, really good effect of, you know, um, having multiple indirect benefits as well. And, you know, um, 
going through to the other sectors. So, you know, um, even other places could be uh, um, involved. Okay. And um, entrepreneurship is all about offering that creative, viable solution to those uh, society needs, you know. So whatever pressing problems and issues can be um, looked at and uh, um, found solutions. Okay. So um, that's almost uh, what I wanted to talk about today. And I'll leave you all thinking about how we can increase more awareness and emphasize, emphasize the um, significance of uh, sociology of tourism, you know, and um, identify social indicators that DMOs could use to assess contribution from tourism. And unless we have all the four pillars being contributed to, it can be a challenge. Yeah? Thank you. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. happy to take any Thank you so much, Dr. Zumiya. That's a very interesting presentation, entrepreneurship in tourism. I guess Indonesia has a lot of the tourism objects too. There's a very big potential here. Uh, but we have four students that already want to ask some questions. Okay, silakan uh, yang ada di ruang auditorium. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Naufal Zamzami. I will ask a question uh, regarding uh, the issue of offer tourism in Indonesia. What is the role of sustainability tourism in overcoming the problem? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so one of the things that I had also mentioned, thank you for your question there, um, was uh, my project in Indonesia, you know, where I'm uh, doing in, uh, a research on artisanal fishes. There's a couple of us doing it, um, um, two of my colleagues from our Australian campus and myself uh, leading the project. And uh, one couple of findings that we found out from our research was that there was uh, a bit less capacity building, um, especially at grassroots level, you know, I've been stressing on the local community. Of course, you have a lot of universities and we all have uh, very good programs in tourism, hospitality, you know, but this is also um, to a certain section of people who can afford to enter these you know but what about those uh, fishermen communities what about the locals who can't afford an ed education we must have more efforts in capacity building i think uh, that was one thing we found out from our indonesian research project and um, you know if there is increased support increased capacity building you know i mean not only um, involve the local universities, you know, I mean, uh, I'm sure the universities can design short courses that could be um, utilized and um, there could be some form of recognition. Of course, um, all this involves, all these ideas involves uh, money. So, um, you know, the government is also limited by its uh, funding, but uh, um, I'm sure there could be CSR projects that universities want to take up and could, uh, you know, um, could take up capacity building. So one is capacity building. And um, as I had pointed out, good governance, you know, the fourth pillar is very, very important. Hope that Thank answers you. Yeah, yeah. So I'll try to summarize and translate it into Bahasa Indonesia. Jadi beliau menyampaikan dua saran, yang pertama adalah capacity building untuk orang-orang di akar rumput, ya orang-orang di komunitas, dan program ini bisa diterapkan juga oleh perguruan tinggi, karena kebanyakan mereka tidak memiliki kapasitas itu. Dan yang kedua adalah pemerintahan yang baik dalam hal ini mengatur regulasi untuk uh, kebijakan tadi. 
All right. I think we are ready to go to the next student. Silakan penanya selanjutnya. See you here. My name is Ramadan Abiyasa Haryanto from State University of Surabaya. So, I would like to ask your opinion about what are the biggest challenges in implementing sustainable tourism in Indonesia? Thank you. Thank you, Ramadan. Um, challenges, um, I think one of the biggest uh, challenge is, um, you know, um, creating awareness. So there should be a lot of uh, awareness programs, you know, um, in terms of how tourism can be beneficial at the same time, you know, um, educating people about the negative impacts so that uh, um, the local community, the businesses can all, uh, um, you know, um, can all pull in and can all uh, understand the need to be sustainable because otherwise you will have a very good destination performing very well economically for one or two years and then you are lost. But remember, you are competing with the whole world, you know, so even for Indonesia, you're competing with Southeast Asia and that's a big uh, market there, you know, so um, similar destinations, similar food, similar cultures could be clashing in terms of uh, getting tourism or tourists to that destination. So the whole idea is um, built on uh, I think one of the biggest challenge is getting people to see the benefits, getting people to understand the negative impacts, whether it is on the social aspects or, you know, environmental um, aspects and to um, minimize these, you know, and how can we minimize the problems that uh, could be a barrier is uh, through educating capacity building and, um, you know, having the right policy in place, you know, um, and I think there should be a more liaising between um, education providers, universities, capacity building, and, uh, you know, uh, the DMO of uh, the local destination. All right. Uh, jadi hal yang penting untuk dilakukan untuk memastikan turisme itu berkelanjutan, uh, beliau tadi menyampaikan adalah membangun awareness atau kesadaran dari para pelaku, khususnya komunitas lokal, terkait uh, dampak positif ataupun dampak negatif khususnya di lingkungan ataupun komunitas sosial dari aktivitas pariwisatanya karena hal ini bisa berdampak pada pariwisata itu mungkin dapat banyak keuntungan di dua tahun pertama tapi kemudian di tahun selanjutnya akan kolaps seperti itu dan beliau menekankan pentingnya capacity building kemudian perlunya ada policy yang sesuai oke okay. thank you dr Zilmia so I will now invite another student to give us a Thank you for this opportunity. Introduce my name is Ahmad Zikrubaki, and I'm from the Digital Business Study Program 2022, State University of Surabaya. I would like to ask you for some information. What I know is that Indonesia is the country with the largest, most active startup in the world, and this will also have an impact on the interest of the younger generation to enter the world of digitalization. Currently in Indonesia, many tourist villas have been built not only in Bali, but in all regions. What do you think is the key to success so, so that community movers can implement sustainable tourist, tourism villas in the current era of digitalization? Thank you. Um, a very good question, that one, you know, um, because, you know, digitalization, it's very easy to explain that in urban locations, you know, and uh, smart tourism activities that are happening in urban destinations, cities especially, you know, um, where um, a lot of things can be uh, resolved through digitalization. But um, at the same time, um, it is also beneficial to 
a lot of uh, rural and peripheral areas, you know. Um, so not only Bali, Bali is uh, pretty well established as a destination in terms of the tourism market. But, um, you know, uh, other areas, um, there could be promotions done, there could be, um, you know, digital, um, perhaps um, platforms, you know, like uh, booking platforms or increasing uh, presence in terms of reviews of visitors who visited that particular destination. Um, even creating apps, you know, um, apps on finding certain location, local food, um, what is available, especially if you add stories to these apps, uh, you know, um, that you create like uh, local people telling you which are the best uh, uh, Indonesian restaurants to target, you know, instead of the BMO telling you these are the best restaurants in uh, Indonesia, go try it. The tourists would prefer the locals telling us that story, you know. So even um, platforms where you can create apps where when a tourist, like for me as a single uh, traveler, if I'm coming to a particular destination, um, I, I would want to know what's the local place to shop, what to look for, you know, um, what to be careful of, you know, so those things can be put up on apps, um, booking platforms, review platforms, um, you know, that are specific to Indonesia. Um, I have, in fact, done another research in Sri Lanka where booking platforms itself, you know, a local uh, team had started a booking platform where um, they uh, enrolled all these fishermen who were having homestays and uh, tourists were getting in touch with uh, these fishermen community and booking their homestay and telling what kind of Sri Lankan food they want to have, you know. And um, I thought that was amazing, you know, because instead of going through the DMO, this digital startup which created this app is helping the local uh, community as well to interact and share their experience, you know. Um, and especially in terms of uh, gastronomy, in terms of uh, um, places to see, things to buy. I mean, we, I mean, tourists are literally shoved in to uh, souvenir shops with cheap souvenirs, you know, probably products made in China, but with, you know, the Indonesian feature or, you know, uh, Singaporean features. You have that everywhere in all destinations, you know, very cheap uh, souvenirs sold not benefiting the local community. So if there are apps that tell you where local handicrafts are found, local uh, souvenirs are found, I think that's a great um, uh, creative way to, uh, to you know, introduce digital in the local regions and especially rural regions. Oh, that's a very interesting idea. So uh, digitalisasi ini sangat mudah diterapkan untuk pariwisata, khususnya yang pertama untuk mempromosikan wisata tadi, yang kedua mungkin kita membuat aplikasi yang mana aplikasi itu akan menunjukkan kita di mana lokasi uh, lokasi pariwisata terdekat, kemudian restoran, tempat untuk beli souvenir, tapi beliau tadi menambahkan kalau bisa ada review langsung oleh uh, user atau customer, sehingga tidak dari hotelnya langsung. Dan beliau tadi terakhir juga menyampaikan, mungkin kita bisa juga membuat apps untuk Uh, nah, untuk uh, informasi di mana kita bisa membeli souvenir karya uh, apa namanya orang-orang lokal gitu karena kebanyakan souvenir itu biasanya made uh, in China ya, tidak dibuat di Indonesia nah, ini bisa sangat berguna untuk membantu komunitas di daerah rural. Oke, okay. I think we still have one question left, Dr. Jomia. Yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Check. Okay, excuse me. My name is Sylvie Karina Fatian Sarzia, and I come from Digital Business International Study Program uh, 2021. And then I want to ask the Sustainable Development Goals have provided guidance in implementing sustainability. So I want to ask how does green innovation affect sustainability? sustainable tourism 
Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that question. And I'm glad you mentioned the sustainable development goals. Uh, so, you know, the goals kind of guide you um, in terms of achieving sustainability. And I think uh, one of the aspects um, that could be, um, you know, uh, solved through digital um, interventions um, in terms of the sustainable development goals uh, could be um, even things like, uh, you know, um, education, for example, um, equality and inclusivity. You can create, um, you know, apps, you can create uh, digital platforms for sharing. Um, and um, since COVID, we have a lot of online, um, you know, uh, presence. And uh, I think there's a lot of uh, educational capacity building programs done by um, certain academics that could be um, introduced for capacity building and, you know, giving um, local communities um, their own time and space to um, interact. So, in fact, um, the whole connection between a tourism destination that generates tourists to a destination where tourists reach could is linked through digital um, you know face whether it is through the booking whether it is through images you know i mean people coming to indonesia now in this current times i mean they can look up indonesia online look on platforms they can look at different reviews you know before coming to indonesia but um, for those um, in the previous era, when there was no digital uh, features, you would be relying on a, a tour guide magazine or a tour guide book, you know, a travel uh, book. And somehow this digital phase has helped in reaching out. So we are spending less money on trying to promote um, too much because, um, you know, there's already so much visibility um, of uh, Indonesia online. And then you're spending less money on, uh, um, in some places, even in capacity building, because uh, there's a huge online presence, you know. So um, there can be ways where uh, digitalization can be used to for capacity building. It can be used for reducing poverty, you know, giving by like the example I told you where fishermen could also be, um, you know, and involved in um, having a digital presence, you know, um, you could have a startup that actually gives these people um, digital pres uh, presence, you know. Um, I was in the Seychelles uh, Island, you know, an island closer to Mauritius, um, and I was eating this plate of fish, and the fish came with a note from the local fishermen who caught it, you know. They retrieve this through an app. They trace back and this app is put into place to mention that, okay, this fish has been caught by this local fisherman, you know. So there are a lot of uh, ideas that can be used, but of course that's another um, big uh, topic on its own uh, creativity um, through digitalization in tourism. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Ilmiah. So, um, digitalisasi bisa kita terapkan dalam semua FG, SDGs yang tadi sudah disampaikan, khususnya untuk membuat aplikasi, membuat platform. Nah, beliau tadi menceritakan ketika beliau di Mauritius, uh, ada aplikasi yang untuk mengenali apakah ikan yang beliau makan itu merupakan tangkapan nelayan lokal. Well, I think that's all, Dr. Ilmiah, for this session. It's been very interesting and fun to follow. So now, I would like to appreciate all of our speakers. So we'll give the certificate. Uh, this, uh, this is a, a ceremonial thing. So I would like to invite um, Dr. Louis Fitzgerald. Um, unfortunately, I need to leave, but I will be in touch with Ikhaz. Yeah, sure, yeah. it. No worries. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zilmia. Thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right, now we would like to appreciate Dr. Louis Fitzgerald. Thank you. Well, 
at snacks who would like to appreciate Dr. Zul may be Thank you so much, Dr. Zul. Thank you so much. Okay, next I would like to welcome Mr. Nur Hayrusi. Okay, last but not least, of course, I would like to invite Dr. Virginia Campbell. Thank you so much. Alright, I think that's a very wonderful and memorable session with all of you. As the moderator, I would like to say, uh, I would like to apologize for any mistakes that I made. It's been a very wonderful experience with all of you. And also, I want to, I want like, I would like to say thank you so much to the business uh, digital department for giving me this opportunity. So I'll give back to the MC then. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Asar, for helping us in today's international webinar. That was amazing. And the first is that before we're going to each the end of our sessions today, I'd like to say congratulations for those who were being active during the discussions. The committees have some store prize for you, and here are the names. So whenever I mention the name, please make sure that you're going to confirm to the committee to find the door prize. Okay, for the speaker one sessions, we have David, Ferdi, Nirmala, and also Igusni. So for the name that I have already mentioned, please you guys can contact the committee for the door prize. Then the second speaker, we have Adila. The third speaker, we have Rafi, Nisha, and Alan. And the last speaker, we have Alan, Rama, Silvika, and Adziki. So for those who have already mentioned the name, for the information about the door prize, you can contact the committee. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now at the end of our webinar sessions. On behalf of the Faculty of Business and Economics Study Program, UNESA, and the Committee of Digital Business Study Program, I would like to say my deepest gratitude for being us in today's uh, good opportunity. And thank you so much for having me. And last but not least, thank you so much for the moderator as well as the distinguished speakers. And I guess see you the next second round of the webinar. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Yusuf Ramanchez signing off. And finally, I say, Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Have a nice day and see you next time.